We're live. Thank you, Chad. Uh, welcome, everybody. We'll begin this council meeting by acknowledging that the county of Prince Edward is on traditional land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years, and we recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection to the land. Today, the county of Prince Edward is built on the many First Nations and Métis people. We are grateful to have an opportunity to meet here, work, and continue stewardship of this land. Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, all for joining us electronically for this special meeting of council regarding the Forward Holdings uh, Quinty Isle Camp Park proposal. Tonight's council meeting will be conducted as a virtual electronic meeting with no physical uh, attendance. Members of the public are able to make deputations and comments to council electronically. Tonight's agenda lists all the items before council for consideration. And the recommended motions on tonight's agenda are shown in boldface. <coughs> of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting live stream meetings on the bottom right of the county's homepage at county.ca. We have 15 deputations this evening under agenda item six and 14 comments from the audience under agenda item seven. Additionally, the applicants representatives will be speaking under agenda item 8.1. Deputations are limited to 10 minutes each and comments from the audience to three minutes each. Because of the number of speakers, I'll be keeping track of time and will advise when speakers have one minute remaining. If speakers are uh, following the meeting over YouTube, if you could please mute or pause the video before it's your turn to speak to avoid audio interference. When you speak, please state your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following your deputation or comment, there may be questions for you from members of council. The names of those making deputations and comments will be included in the council minutes and form part of the public record posted to the county's website. I am very appreciative of the work members of the public have put into their comments, whether being made this evening or through previous emails, texts, or other means. I'm similar, similarly appreciative of the work undertaken by our staff and each member of council concerning this file. Any matter decided this evening by either resolution or bylaw is final and cannot be revisited by council until four regular meetings have expired without a two third majority vote. For those participating in the electronic meeting, if I could ask everybody to um, mute their cell phone so we don't get that interference either. So we'll move to item number three, the confirmation of the agenda. Could I have a mover and seconder for that, please? Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor McMahon. All those Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prinzen McMahon motion that the agenda for the special council meeting of April 14, 2021 be confirmed. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. So we'll move to disclosure of pecuniary interest and in general nature thereof. Does anybody have anything they wish to declare? Seeing none, we will move to announcements. Are there any announcements from members of council? No? Okay, then we're going to go to um, deputations. And as I say, we have 15. Um, everybody has been advised of what the... Uh, you know what the procedures are here. I would ask council that okay, so we'll move to disclosure of pecuniary interest in general nature thereof. Does anybody have anything they wish to declare? If people could please turn off YouTube. Um, if I just want to remind council that um, if there are questions of the uh, deputants, if we could avoid redundancies. And if um, staff can respond to any issues that may arise during the deputations when we get to um, item 8.1. So if they could uh, take notes. So we'll start with the first deputation, which is Alan Young. Alan, you are, I assume with us. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I am. Okay. Thank you. And, and, um, and uh, is the audio and visual uh, functioning? Okay, and just a reminder, you've got 10 minutes. 
Yes, absolutely. I will. I don't believe I will take that much long. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for all the work that's taken in uh, pulling this all together. On behalf of my family, I wish to express our strong belief that the proposed request for rezoning for the Salmon Point property by Forward Holdings should be dismissed uh, due to its incompatibility with both the spirit and letter of the current and proposed official plan. It's numerous, in my opinion, unmitigable long-term impacts, impacts on the surrounding ecosystems as well as the safety, health and quality of life for existing communities. To make an exception of this magnitude, anticipating irreversible impacts associated with inserting development that will have the population of Wellington imposed on a natural undeveloped shoreline and valuable ecosystem, in my mind sets a very deleterious precedent from a governance point of view, let alone an ecological or community point of view. And in my opinion would be an abdication of the county's responsibility and commitment to wisely steward its extraordinary legacy of land and shore. Yes, I live on Sioux Harbor Road. So some might wanna dismiss this as just a NIMBY reaction, but it's that's simply not the case here. This is our backyard as citizens of Prince Edward County. I walk the shoreline year round and have done so for many years, as do hundreds of community residents and visitors who come to this lovely corner of the world because it's rich, it's undisturbed, it's unique. It's, it plays a, a very big role, not just in local ecosystems, but regional ecosystems and international ecosystems when you look at the birds and other, other populations. Um, it's something that we believe we are all proud of and being, we're all stewards of and where we hope to be able to bring children and grandchildren in the future. Let's be clear, this will fundamentally, this proposal will fundamentally change uh, that world if we allow a new, essentially informal town site, especially one that contradicts clearly expressed values of the official plan on the shores of Super Harbor. Yes, we need to adapt to growth and opportunity. Yes, and what we need to do so with a clear vision of the future. This amendment by definition departs from the very vision that so many citizens and officials have worked so hard to agree to. I find myself asking, why would we do this to ourselves and each other when we have other options? We have a truly unique privilege and obligation to take care of some of the rarest shoreline ecosystems and communities in the Great Lakes. That's not an opinion, it's a statement of fact. What we do here will further impact future generations whose options and resources for the future have already been severely and irreversibly reduced by choices made in the interest of short-term economic gains. I've recently learned that these questions of intergenerational responsibility in regards to both this application and the integrity of the official plan have been echoed by the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. And this certainly adds to the obligations we have as citizens and residents to respect the land and to ensure that our actions are consistent with the principles and practices of reconciliation, which are essential for the long-term health of our communities and our role as Canadian citizens. There's no doubt that, can they, that the county will continue to grow as it should. It will be under greater pressure going forward. And especially we've learned that this year because it's such a sanctuary. It's such a rarity in this overdeveloped world of ours. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't benefit from this growth but I am saying that we should do so wisely with discretion and forethought. Otherwise we'll kill the goose that laid the golden egg. We'll end up just another careless contributor to the degradation of the Great Lakes, which we all love so much. So the core concerns we have can be boiled down to four key areas that I will summarize here. Others who can speak to the details of these concerns in, with greater uh, knowledge than, than I have, but I will say as someone who has spent much of his professional life reviewing environmental and social impact assessments in the mining and forestry sector is that the documentation provided so far on the impacts and mitigation plan does not inspire or convince me at all that this plan is in any way safe for community members or the environment. Importantly, it is also clear from the recent, recently submitted letters of the Don Mer Donald Miracle of the, of the Mohawks of, of Quinty that these and other inadequacies of the impact assessment are shared by others and need to be taken very seriously by decision makers. Disrespect for the rights of indigenous rights holders in and of itself should be enough to put this and its proponents out of consideration. Sadly, 
the other, the ways in which the obvious long-term impacts are explained away with narrowly scoped technical calculations, it's not uncommon, but it's not something we should be adopting here as a standard for planning. We need to be better and we need to do better. So in short, the four points are, both the previous and new versions of the official plan specifically highlight supporting the protecting of agricultural nature of the county, yet this proposal will result in an irrevocable loss of farmland and rare shoreline farmland at this point. And that's something that is happening all too regularly in these cases. This is a troubling trend that should not be encouraged. The proposal should eliminate or would eliminate the important opportunity for linking ecologically significant areas of Sioux Harbor wetlands with sandbanks as envisioned by both the provincial policy statement on natural heritage and the official plan. The official plan is clear that no new shoreline tourism areas should be created until the existing supply is exhausted. My understanding is that this proposal violates that principle given the availability of lands inside the existing designated corridor. And finally, the absence of adequate infrastructure, roads, water, sewerage, and safety poses many unacceptable substantial risks to neighbors. And these have been articulated uh, very clearly in the public comments and other residents as well uh, um, should be, who will be affected by these changes. Compensating for these inadequacies will cost taxpayers substantially. It's unfair and inappropriate that the developers will impose these risks and costs on other county residents and taxpayers. It's, in light of the above, it's, it's really hard to understand how a rezoning application could be treated seriously as an option, let alone that would be expedited in advance of the finalization of, of the official plan. It just seems like a clear violation of the spirit, intent, and due process associated with all the work and thought put in by so many county residents and experts over the years. It would imply that our decision makers are comfortable ignoring the legitimate informed concerns and interests, wills, and, and forcefully state, stated concerns of so many residents who are seeking balance and sustainability for the current and future generations of the county in favor of short-term profits for a few individuals. It's not about being pro or anti-business, it's about signaling clearly that our intent to support responsible and sustainable business as part of our community's future. What worries me deeply, aside from the impacts on Sioux Harbor and what this means as a rare place, is the precedent that if granted to this developer would be for other decisions going forward. I think it would, un it would undermine the meaning of the official plan. It would suggest that, that public consultations, which clearly do not support this at this point, do not significantly influence council decision making. It says it's okay to approve projects that have been shown to disrespect our indigenous rights holders. And ultimately it says that all of the above are okay to be trumped by the interests of the individuals have influence over political process. Therefore, we urge you to make a decision that is an investment in the truly sustainable and unique future of the county. You won't regret it if you do that. And you will be remembered for your wisdom and your commitment or not. When you combine these factors with the fact that this geography being contemplated for development is a truly highly valuable ecological region of shoreline that is genuinely rare anywhere on Lake Ontario. We can't understate this fact. And it is enjoyed by many residents and visitors precisely for this reason. It is to me, therefore, unthinkable that a plan that is so out of touch with this and disrespectful of the future, the sustainable future of the county should be considered any further. Thank you very much for listening to my deputation. Hey, thank you very much, Alan. I'll um, open the floor to any questions from members of council. Let's take a look for a show of hands. Seeing none, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, the work you put in your deputation. We have a mover and a seconder to receive this, please. Councillor Forrester, seconded by Councillor McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's Forrester McMahon motion and the deputation by Alan Young regarding the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file number OPA2 2018 and Z25-18 Board Holdings Inc. and Quinty Isle Camp Park be received. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you. We'll move to uh, deputation number two and Mr. Don McLean. 
done. I see a D there. There you are. And just a reminder, you have uh, 10 minutes. You're, on, you're muted. Okay. Now can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Perfect. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present my views. Uh, my name is Don McLean. I live at 196 Salmon Point Road, which is one of three contiguous properties that my family owns on Salmon Point Road and Nelson's Lane. We've been seasonal residents mm -hmm. and love the area since 1956. And like other Salmon Point residents, I'm concerned about the rezoning, but my particular concern is about the road safety. It's already a very dangerous road, Salmon Point Road, in the summer in particular. It's quiet during the winter, but very busy in the summer. And I really cringe every time I see one of the camper vans wielding around the corner, which is relatively blind, and you've got a bunch of kids riding on bicycles. The density of use is going up. It's projected to go up 70%. Maybe it'll be more, but that's a, that's a big expansion. We'd made an earlier request for improvements to the road, just simple safety signs, but you increase the volume of traffic, the degree we are looking at here, and it's just an unsafe situation for a single artery to have that many vehicles, including big vehicles, moving down it. A second access is needed. And we've suggested the access be through Wellbanks Road, but it can also go, come via Kelly as well. So there's at least three different ways that traffic can move down that Wellbanks Road in addition to Salmon Point Road. And our point is, it's, it is only fair that the burden of this expansion, and I, I want to preface this by saying the wards have been excellent neighbors and very good corporate citizens from what I've seen. That's not the issue. The issue is about just common sense safety for people that are going to be using it, including those coming from Quinty's Isle. It's a busy road. And of course, from a planning perspective, the density issue is going to be something that needs to be thought about as well, because this is not the only expansion that's going to take place. They have a very large land position. This is the third expansion I've seen from Quinty's Isle over the years. The lighthouse lands at the end of the road are zoned for development, and you have other large land packages on Salmon Point Road. So it's going to get even busier. It just makes common sense to share the burden from our perspective. And I think I'm, this, this is a view that's shared by everybody that lives on Salmon Point Road. So, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity to present my views. I decided it should be much less than 10 minutes because you've got a lot of things to think about. But road safety is something that council should have very much in the back of their minds going forward with this kind of density, having such a large, basically city, summer city, with a single artery doesn't make sense. And that's consistent with what your own council, your own, um, your own uh, peer review ended up saying about the safety issue. There should be another access. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, Don. Um, any questions from members of council? Or Mr. McLean. No, no questions, Don. Thank you very much okay. for uh, thank you, Mayor Ferguson. Forward this, uh, this evening, I'd like to get a mover and a seconder to to um, receive the the uh, deputation, Councillor Margotson, seconded by Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a Margotson Prinzen motion that the deputation from Don McLean. Um, Regarding, just a moment please, regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications files number OPA A2 2018 and Z25-18 for forward holdings in Quinney Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. We'll move to item 6.3, deputation by Jeffrey Burt. Jeffrey, are you? Uh, there you are. Okay. Yep. 
Terrific. Thank you. Just a reminder, you've got uh, 10 minutes and the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for, for hearing me out today. Um, my name is Jeffrey Burt and I'm the CEO of the Consecon Foundation, uh, which is a local private charitable foundation. Um, in my remarks today, what I, what I hope I can do is kind of zoom out a little bit and, and try and place the South Shore in a global context when it comes to biodiversity. Um, I think, you know, it's sometimes it's important to take a sort of broader view. It's easy to get bogged down in the details. Um, so hopefully I can, I can do that relatively quickly. So the South Shore of Prince Edward County truly is an area of global biological significance. It's a migratory path for birds, endangered butterflies, it's home to more than 40 species at risk. And so why is this important? Well, uh, it's also the site of the first new conservation reserve that's been created in more than 20 years. Um, it's a site that has sure. generated tremendous interest on the part of conservationists. Uh, there's a huge investment from charitable foundations from the Ontario government. Um, and, and this is because this area has global biological significance. Now, um, how, what's the relevance to uh, QIC? I think, you know, when, when you look at a map, it's just common sense that you have this area um, that's deemed uh, urgent for protection in terms of uh, things like monarch butterflies, uh, Blanding's turtles. The announcement that uh, the Minister of Environment made on the beach at Point Peter was just a few kilometers away from where we're proposing uh, building effectively a large settlement. So uh, I think that uh, we need to consider this broader context. Um, you know, there, there's definitely uh, a sort of consensus and, and a lot of momentum building uh, towards the protection of the South Shore. And I think, you know, this will be something that has generational implications, uh, what we choose to do uh, on the South Shore. And I think we need to really think about whether we can afford uh, to lose this kind of natural heritage for future generations. And so uh, whether or not, uh, you know, it's, it's possible to have this large a number of people um, and not have it, an impact on the animals that live there. Uh, I'm skeptical, you know, I mean, bringing hundreds of new vehicles, noise pollution, light pollution, uh, you know, sewage and garbage and all these kind of things. Uh, I just want to raise my skepticism um, that this is a good idea. And, you know, this is, this is a planning decision with tremendous uh, consequences. And so I just want, I want everyone to kind of consider uh, this broader picture. We're really the stewards of an area of global biological significance. So thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Jeffrey, let me see if there are any questions for you, members of council. Is that Councilor Roberts? Have you got your hand up? No? Okay, no, we don't, uh, no questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Councilor McNaughton, seconded by Councilor McMahon. Thank you, this is the McMahon McMahon. Uh, motion that the deputation by Jeffrey Burt regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file numbers OPA2-2018 and Z25-18 Forward Holdings Inc. and Quintial Camp Park Inc. be received. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your time this evening. Thank you. And we'll move to 6.4. Ellen Riche. Yes, hello. If I pronounced the last name correctly, Ellen. Close enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you've, so, got, you've got 10 minutes. Yes, I know. So I will be sharing my screen.
Okay. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Uh, do you see? Yep. Okay. Um, so I have a PowerPoint presentation. So yes, I'm Alain Richet. I live at 144 Salmon Point Road and I have been there for four years. Uh, and this is my deputation. Um, page down. No, it's not going to do it that way. Oh dear. Just a minute. Okay, so I have a presentation plan. Um, so I'll describe the life in the county near Salmon Point, off season during peak, demographics of Salmon Point Road. Uh, I will uh, go through the official plan, the articles that, that in my view clearly indicate this uh, expansion uh, is against the plan and I'll have some conclusions. So um, this is the county, as you can see. And this little tongue here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this little tongue here is Salmon Point, and then there's Sandbanks here. So this small area of the county is responsible in the summer for the total overriding of the country of, of the roads getting packed and all of the stores and the everything get and people complaining. And you got a lot of complaints last summer, I understand. So in the county, especially at Salmon Point, it's a rural area, it's nice and quiet. The internet's not very good here, but at least when there's not too many people around, you sort of get some. Traffic is, as Dawn said, pretty slow uh, and people are courteous during peak season, very busy, very noisy. The internet totally almost disappears. Too many people going off the same towers and they're few and far between. And the walking and the cycling is quite scary, um, mostly because there's no bike lane or sidewalk and there is a, a, a blind curve. We saw last summer during COVID, it just got worse on everything. And there was a lot of littering and tourists tried to squat on our lands. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, pie charts and bar charts, but anyway. So the demographics of Salmon Point Road. So the number of uh, residences, uh, if you count trailers, because they look like houses as residences anyway, uh, there's 619 presently in Quinty's Isle and 70 on Salmon Point Road, including the houses that are on the lanes on Salmon Point Road. Uh, if this project goes forward, you're talking about 960. So our piece of the pie of the uh, people who live here becomes much smaller in comparison. Um, so part two of the, uh, the official plan uh, talks about vision and it says in 2.1.3 that in the future, not now even, in the future, the county will be tranquil. It'll have rural charm and we will have properly preserved it. 2.3 talks about growth and it says in anticipation of the pressures of growth, you need careful planning and decision-making to ensure that the unique and special characteristics of the county are not lost in order to accommodate growth pressure. And I know there's a lot of growth pressure. But this article is very clear. Um, 2.4.10 talks about settlement in rural areas. We are a rural area. We're not downtown Picton here. At least we're not supposed to be. Um, and the plan specifically says in these areas to not create an overcrowded and suburbanized countryside. If you go and drive through Quinty's Isle Camp Park, I mean, it's a lovely development, but it's it's basically a it's 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 a it's it's a suburbanized area. Everybody has their lawns and their porches, and it's 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 not rural. Part three, general development strategies. Uh, the county adopted the principle of sustainable development. Um, talked about not uh, making the same mistakes that we, we've made in the past. 1.1.2 talks about taking into account the area's relation to the surrounding environment. Again, we're rural and you're gonna have 3000 people there um, in this tiny little area. It also talks about the county's economy. Um, and internet is not listed here, but in order to properly work 
you need internet. And people on Salmon Point Road who live here all year round do work and they do need the internet. And if you add another 300 or, or more users of the internet in, in, in that area, it's just gonna totally crash. It's already crashing in the summer anyway. But <laughs> part four, land use designation policies. 4.1.4, designation of new areas to shoreland shall only be considered once those established by this plan are largely developed. Please note that there presently exists a large parcel of land already zoned shoreland at the end of Salmon Point Road. So this is the official plan zoning map. You see Quinty's Isle, this is Salmon Point, Here's Salmon Point Road, which is a dead end road, and it ends on this big piece of pale yellow, which is shoreland. And it is now not developed. And it will be one day, most likely. And there you'll get more hundreds and hundreds of people in this tiny little area with a dead end road. Part four, land, continue. Land use designation policies, 4.4.3. Very specific to this. This, this issue. Commercial development. The following criteria should be reviewed in consideration of an expanded resort. I think that's what we're talking about here. The suitability of the proposed density and scale of the development in relation to the site and the surrounding land uses, as well as the adequacy of public road access to the site. So here's another bar chart. <laughs> this is this speaks to density. So the first two charts are the estimated population. If you assume 2.5 people per house hold, you would now have 15, what, 1,548 in Quinty's Isle in blue and 175 on the rest of the road. With the increase, it would be 2,400 versus 175. But this is talking, we're talking density. So let's do it by density. So I calculated the area of Quinty's Isle and divided it by the amount of people. And you get a density of 1,224 people per square kilometer versus on the rest of Salmon Point, only 21. You go through this development, you get up to almost 2,000 per square kilometer versus 21. The plan talks about the density in relation to surrounding land use. This is not, this is pretty clear to me. Anyway, public road access to the camp park. The, the county commissioned a peer review to the traffic study in 2018. I think it was in June. And it was done by Jewel Engineering, who concluded that with the development, Quinty's Isle would be a residential community larger than Wellington. And in the big picture, they quote, it requires both 24 seven emergency access and for safety purposes, a, dis a disaster egress. Jewel makes a very strong recommendation in their peer review. They say the proposed development requires a commercial standard entrance from Well Banks Road. Now, what's most interesting about this is your planning report that was submitted to council does not include this very important recommendation by a professional engineer. It'd be interesting to know why not. In conclusion, I'm asking you to please consider the already disproportionate population density that we have here and that someday someone is going to develop the shoreland at the end of Salmon Point. Finally, should you proceed with this development, ensure that a full commercial entrance on Wellbanks Road is implemented as your engineer recommended. And that's all I got. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Elaine. Okay, um, any questions from members of council? If you could just stop sharing your screen now. Yeah, I uh, just have to figure out here, stop share. There we go. There we go. Uh, thank you, any questions from members of council? Seeing none, okay, thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you. Appreciate your time and your efforts. Thank you. So we'll move to, uh, are we
we need a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please. Councilor McMahon, seconded by Councilor McNaughton. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a McMahon McNaughton motion that the deputation by Alain Richet regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications, file numbers OPA 2 2018 and Z25 18 Forward Holdings, Inc. and Quinty Isle Camp Park, Inc. be received. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. So we'll now move to 6.5 and Patricia Gale. And it's my understanding this is by phone. Chad? Yes, it is, sir. Oh, okay. Is that you, Patricia? Yes, it is, Patricia, in the flesh. <laughs> okay. Uh, just I, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. A reminder, you got 10 minutes. Okay. And just pleasure. may I check first? I believe Chad is going to be advancing my PowerPoint presentation for me. Chad, can you let me know when you're ready? Uh, through the chair, it is ready now. Excellent. My name is Patricia Gale, and I live on Wellbanks Road on the farm property that abuts Quinty's Isle ground on their northern border. I've been following and engaged with this proposal since it first came to light in May of 2018 and have written numerous emails and letters stating our firm objection to this rezoning proposal and proposed development. Additionally, I've made deputations to PHAC in October of 2020 and our esteemed council in November of 2020. I do not wish to cover the same ground as in my November deputation, but rather highlight several key issues of our objection and bring to light additional questions and areas of concern. These center around the following themes as shown on this slide. My first four topics are linked. We have unanswered questions around the negative impact on the existing PSW of such a development, as well as, as, well as other environmental concerns such as 365 days of nighttime light impacting bird and bat migration. Turning lights inwards does little to negate the negative impact on wildlife and vegetation. We have concerns for smoke from an additional 337 fire pits, increased noise and human interference on the wildlife, or pardon me, human interference on the PSW, wildlife, and neighbors in the area. Regarding the PSW, the IBI report, consultants hired by the county, states, the overall construction in the area will likely have more negative impacts on the overall ecological, ecological integrity of the area than any net benefit from creating a deep pond with plantings, for example, the introduction of invasive species. RFA states that the plan will allow for wildlife movement across the lands relatively un unimpeded by their new arbitrary wildlife corridors. In fact, the animals will not be allowed to traverse the property, but must go around it. These new magical corridors will not diminish the use of the land by wildlife and amphibians in the area as they've used them for decades. They will not avoid an area, area populated by trailers just because you have decided they should. Any development on this land disrupts their natural patterns and will certainly lead to animal death and potential eradication of species. I reiterate the profound lack of study of the wildlife in the area. Breeding bird and wildlife studies were limited to a total of 10 hours in May and June of 2017 and 2019. Why would an environmental impact study on a significant migratory area for birds, bats, and butterflies not include visits and research during peak migration months of February, March, April, September, October, and November. My own livestock barn, at, sorry, back up, amphibian sub surveys were limited to three dates in April, May, and June of 2017 and limited to auditory surveys. Not all amphibians in the area have a voice. For example, the blue-spotted salamander. My own livestock barn, located one kilometer north, is alive with an active little brown bat colony and barn swallows. So clearly, they also would exist on the subject property, yet did not receive credible mention. The developers and their consultants have made no attempt to conduct an inclusive and robust study of the area in the intervening years. Has the county asked the developer to provide a proposed construction schedule for this proposal if it were to be approved? I ask as I'm curious as to when things might be done throughout a calendar year. From the developer's own consultant's EIS, including correspondence from the MNRF, 
I pulled information on when certain activities could not take place due to nesting, breeding, or other issues. I believe you can see from the chart my concern for just when activities would not be undertaken. Page references are noted on the chart. A proposed nearly 10-acre sewage disposal area is planned for the northeast section of the property, land located mere feet from prime agricultural ground, located on ground that slopes to the southeast towards the provincially significant wetland. While much has been made of the fact the proposed development would be serviced by a shoreline well, our requests for clarification and insurance around water taking have gone unanswered. The community would like a legal guarantee that there is not now nor will there be in the future a direct connection between the shoreline well and the local aquifers. The aquifers in the area are known to be under stress and there is a mixture of old dug wells and drilled wells in the area. Additionally, should this development proceed, there is a need to dig up almost 80 acres of ground to install underground electric, water and sewage lines. In addition to digging, blasting may be required for the sewage disposal area. Who has studied the impact of this level of excavation on our local aquifers? The existing community has the right to a source of reliable, clean, safe water. In my deputation to PHAC, I surfaced the fact that the land in question is the last remaining worked farm field that touches Lake Ontario on the entire south shore from Salmon Point to Ostrander Point. This fact alone is an extraordinary testament to its cultural and heritage value. The impact on municipal services seemed to be limited in reports to fire services. Has anyone gathered data on all emergency services to the existing park over the last 10 years to assess the increase and make an estimation of the impact on all emergency services should a settlement of the proposed size be approved? Also, let us not forget about the impact on our Pictum Hospital. It's time to assess if this area of Athol is now saturated enough with tourist accommodations before adding to an already stressed out community and road system. As I mentioned in my deputation to Council in November, the community has been left standing on the side of the road regarding this proposal. To date, all the questions we have been asking since 2018 go unanswered. This is not community engagement. In the IBI report, they noted that reports do not directly respond to nor summarize the range of comments received from the public and that revised submission materials had not been provided to the public. There has never been a meaningful community meeting regarding this proposal. The May 2018 Council meeting, as some of you may remember, raised serious questions around notification. The August 2018 meeting at the Athol Town Hall was led by the developer's Toronto lawyer and not intended to be a two-way information session. Only after intense pressure from attendees was there any exchange of information. The August 2020 meeting offered boards with information, but once again, no real meaningful way for information to be shared openly for all to hear. Good neighbours talk to each other to address concerns and misconceptions. The developers have never attempted to contact neighbours for that purpose. I also understand they have failed to have meaningful communication with their existing full-time and seasonal residents regarding this proposal. We are concerned about the credibility and sincerity of some consultations and peer reviews that have taken place. What has not escaped me is the fact that experts don't agree, not on environmental issues or cultural heritage issues. For the most part, consultants who did not see negative environmental impacts or understand the cultural and historical nature of this property were those who chose not to visit the site, including the 11th hour cultural peer review by a Western Ontario consultant. Staff may wish to revisit their documents submitted to Council dated January and April of this year to correct some errors. Four years into this proposal, the community is uncomfortable with documents signed off and read by members of staff that contain errors that were easily found. The intersection noted as functioning with adequate safety and service levels is noted as Salmon Point Road and County Road 12. However, at no point do Salmon Point Road and County Road 12 meet. Your report should say County Road 18. Additionally, the correct property name for the Stage 3 archaeological assessment is Burlingham, not Burlington. Perhaps that's just a typo. 
The IBI states that a key consideration which remains is justification for the shoreland designation, a point raised as far back as the pre-consultations in discussion pre-consultation discussions in 2016. At no time has the developer, their consultants, or planning staff demonstrated or explained to the community how this rezoning and proposed development is in the public interest. The community has strongly objected to this proposed rezoning amendment to allow this or any development of this property, as well as the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte, who have also voiced their concerns for this proposal. Members of this community have stepped up and donated their own land to ensure the preservation of the South Shore for generations to come. This council has the opportunity to do the right thing right now and show their commitment to our official plan and the same concern and commitment to the preservation of what is unique and extraordinary about our South Shore. Council needs to decline this rezoning request to prevent this proposed development or any future development on this ground. To approve it is a betrayal of community trust. The property is a true jewel in the crown of Prince Edward County's South Shore and a cultural heritage designation needs to be applied. Protect it now while you still can. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Patricia. I think I took a breath, I'm not sure. I think you did, but it came through very clearly. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from members of council? Seeing none, thank you very much for your, uh, your time and your thoughts, Patricia. Thank you. We could have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please. Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Harper Forrester motion that the deputation by Patricia Gale regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file numbers OPA 2 2018, Z25 18, Forward Holdings Inc., and Quinial Camp Park Inc. be received. Thank you. Those in favor? That carries, thank you. So we'll now move to Murray Smith. Um, Murray, are you, well, you're, I'm sure you're coming. It's connecting audio. Just waiting for Mr. Smith to connect here. Mr. Smith, are you there? Chad, is there any uh, assistance needed here? Uh, it seems like he's just having trouble connecting. Um, I'm going to try putting him in the waiting room and bringing him back in. Oh. Okay. Well, have we got... Um... The next deputation is in the waiting room. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's move to the next one, and then we'll go back to Mr. Smith. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, David Donnelly is entering now. Hello, David. David, are you there? Mr. Donnelly, if you could click, click uh, to audio. Need your audio. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Your Worship. My name's David Donnelly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So we've got, we've got the audio worked out. A reminder, you've got uh, 10 minutes. Thank you for uh, coming forward this evening. The floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. My name is David Donnelly. We represent the Friends of South Shore, or FOSS, in the application matter regarding the Quinty Isle Camp Park. We have been working with an experienced land use planner, an ecologist, and two cultural heritage experts in order to prepare a number of submissions that have been made previously. 
I would ask that council adopt the whole of those previous submissions as part of my deputation this evening. Now, the first and primary question that council needs to ask itself in my respectful commission submission regards the uh, Prince Edward County official plan policy section 3.3.4, which is tourism development. In order for you to vote for this application, in favor of this application, you need to be able to answer this question in the affirmative. Is the proposed trailer park in keeping with the rural character and charm of the county? And does it promote year round tourism? My respectful submission, the obvious answer is no. Any other answer is not credible in my respectful submission. There's a second important policy in your official plan that must also be tested before you cast your vote. And that second question is, does the trailer park enhance and complement the existing tourism base? Now, for you to answer in the affirmative, again, in my respectful submission, you would stand alone amongst the rural communities in Southern Ontario as having trailer parks as part of your tourism strategy. Certainly trailer parks belong in certain parts of the province, but the long and complicated history of trailer parks being turned into permanent residence is something which this council should take significant note. In my respectful submission, there is no possible way that this trailer proposed expansion of the trailer park has been seriously considered as part of your ongoing tourism strategy. On that basis and that basis alone, it's my respectful submission that based on a review of, of the material that's been presented with respect to the economic impacts, the servicing, the environmental impacts produced by FOSS's experts, council should vote against the proposed 20 hour camp park amendments. Now again, FOSS has been working with a senior land use planner and Mr. Alan Ramsey will be making a deputation uh, later this evening. But critically, it is Mr. Ramsey's opinion that the proposal does not support the rural character of the county. In particular, at capacity, the camp park will rival Picton as the largest settlement in the county. The proposed seasonal trailer park represents a significant residential development that if expanded will accommodate approximately 850 to 1,000 people which could possibly be four times that at peak periods. In rural areas, this, this scale of development should be directed to rural settlement areas and properly planned through an official plan. Mr. Donnelly is frozen. Mr. Donnelly, we can't uh, hear you. Chad? It looks as though he's left in the chair. Oh, there he is, he's come back. I'm sorry, I may have frozen, uh, Your Worship. You did. Um, I, I will, <laughs> I apologize. I apparently happened to Condoleezza Rice recently on CNN, so I don't feel too bad. Um, backing up, um, at peak periods, this um, development could be four times um, the proposed uh, population of 850 to 1,000 people. Now, FOSS has also hired two um, land use planners, expert in cultural heritage landscapes. This to me is really the future of tourism in Prince Edward County as you transition to a higher value a tourism base. Uh, that is oriented around uh, natural heritage features and the intersection of um, uh, high quality tourism, including uh, uh, active recreation. According to Mr. McClellan of the ERA Architects, based on his review of the documents submitted debate, debate, and I'm quoting now, it is my opinion the subject property and surrounding lands have significant cultural heritage value and that the cultural heritage impact assessment does not demonstrate the proposed rezoning will not impact the cultural value of the site and its context. That's very significant insofar as 
the vote that you are to take tonight is not strictly a technical vote. You do have to weigh up all the technical evidence that's been presented with respect to species at risk, cultural heritage, First Nations, uh, cultural heritage landscapes, First Nations archaeology, the sufficiency of the consultation program with First Nations, and a host of other technical issues. But Section 2 of the Planning Act requires this council to be responsible for its own decision. Tonight, you're not voting on the sufficiency of the staff report. You're not voting on the application. You're voting your own conscience with respect to whether you think this development is in the public interest and in the best interest of residents. It is not a technical exercise of weighing up reports one against another. Critically, what I haven't heard here tonight is any support for residents for a trailer park expansion. That should be something that is very telling to you as councillors. You need to be able to explain to residents in my respectful submission, how it is that you're introducing this new, essentially settlement area into onto the South shore of Prince Edward County, which should be kept in a relatively undeveloped state. Where there is to be development it is to follow the official plan. And that is to bring in high quality tourism enterprises that respect and enhance the rural county, the rural character of the county. And so at bottom, when there is an appeal of this decision, you will be not defending the uh, technical merits of the case, you'll be defending your decision. And so in closing, I ask you, prior to casting your vote, to explain how it is that you can come to, in your own mind, the conclusion that this development is conforms to the official plan with all the policies that you've heard so far and we'll hear more, but more importantly, how this decision can possibly be in the public interest when you're hearing from your own residents that they are against it for all the good reasons that have been stated previously, for the reasons that I have stated, for the reasons in all the technical reports that have submitted, and most importantly, from the comments of the audience, in my respectful submission, if you listen carefully, you'll hear from people that either are ask, that are asking you to vote no, or to be able to look, or be able to look them in the eye and justify this decision. With that, Your Worship, those are my submissions, and I await any questions. Thank you very much, David. Let's see if there are any questions of members of council. Anybody got anything? No, nope. seeing none, thank you very much, David. Thank you. So Chad, we're going to, we'll need a mover and a seconder to receive this deputation and then we'll move back to Mr. Smith. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Mm -hmm. Mover and a seconder for, to receive this. Councillor St. Jean, seconded by Councillor Margotson. Audio? Yeah. <laughs> my apologies, Your Worship. Uh, who was my seconder again? Councillor Margotson. Margotson, St. Jean Margotson motion that the deputation by David Donnelly regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file numbers OPA 2 2018 and Z 2518 Forward Holdings Inc and Quinty Isle Camp Park, Inc. be received. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you, Aries. So we'll now move back to Murray Smith. Murray, uh, there you are. Can you hear me? And if we can test your audio. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? That's much better. Uh, thank you for joining us. A reminder that you have 10 minutes, but the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Ferguson and councillors. Uh, good evening. My name is Murray Smith, and I'm speaking on behalf of the 75 members of Seoul, Save Our Heritage Lands. This application seeks a significant change of land use along the south shore at Sioux Harbor and will forever change these natural heritage features by developing them for tourist commercial purposes. 
Now, the county official plan and a provincial policy statement provide the means to guide the county and developers to realize the county vision. Every opportunity to amend this guidance to accommodate development should not be granted. Further high density development creep along the South Soup Harbor South Shore, which in its natural state is unique along the Lake Ontario shoreline, does not align with the county vision expressed in the present official plan or the new official plan. Quinney's Isle purchased a well banks parcel surely aware of the environmental limitations. Ownership does not provide the assumed right to then permanently change the characteristics of a protected area, simply upon request to amend the parameters of what can be done with the land. The development seeks the significant change of land use along the South Shore that will forever change natural heritage features and shorelines of the county. This through further development for tourist commercial purposes. The project permanently alters the landscape and pro propo proposes a substantial increase in the footprint of trailer homes and services in this environmentally sensitive area. In essence, the developer proposes an even larger privately owned subdivision to the present circumstances. Habitat loss is the greatest risk to biodiversity. Human intrusion compounds this loss. Ownership of lands does not convey the right to unfettered growth and destruction of habitat. This particular application would allow for development impinging on sensitive wetlands. By definition, mitigation efforts denote damages. Although we in the county are surrounded by much natural wealth, it is not a reason to squander what is recognized as valuable and significant natural habitat by developing the landscape. The Environmental Commission of Ontario recommended that lands adjacent to coastal wetlands should only be developed in very rare cases, not as a matter of routine. The reason is simple. Too many people are not good for wetlands and the endangered species that inhabit them. The impact of wetlands is a sustaining natural resource to nature and the ecosystem demands that we respect this natural landscape. Development, in this case, adjacent to a recognized provincially significant coastal wetland should be seen as damaging the integrity of that ecosystem. Prince Edward County Savage, our heritage land supports the efforts of Friends of South Shore to protect this special shoreline habitat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. We'll uh, see if there are any questions from members of council. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Smith? Seeing none, thank you very much, Murray. I'll ask for a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Prince. Read that, please. You're on mute. This is a Bailey Prince in motion that the deputation by Murray Smith regarding a no nod. Steve, mute's not on. What's not on? You're good now, Councillor Bailey. You're just delayed a little mute's bit. Mute's not Start on. Again. Okay, let's have uh, Councillor Prince, and why don't you move? Thank then? you. Oh, sorry, who is my seconder? Uh, Councillor Prinzen. Okay. Are you going to be able to? Let me try it again. Can you make the motion? Try again. Is that the deck? Uh, sorry. Uh, Prinzen motion that the deputation by Murray Smith regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application files number OPA 2 2018. And Z2518 uh, Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinney's Isle Camp Party Inc. be received. Made it. Thank you very much. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you very much, Murray. So we'll move now to 6.8, Sandra Gorenson. Sandra, there you are. Uh, welcome to this meeting this evening. And a reminder that you have 10 minutes to make your deputation. And you're currently on mute. Okay, I, am I unmuted now? You're unmuted now and a reminder you've got 10 minutes. 
Okay, well, um, I'm gonna meander a little bit first. I first saw the county in 1973 and fell so much in love with it, I ended up buying a piece of property on Big Island on the North Shore. It's, it's the people here are just lovely and so is the county. It's a beautiful place and we need to take good care of it. Um, I'm, I remember one of my little visits up to um, the trailer park and a chap there pointed out that they had a wetland, but they didn't have any Blanding's turtles because he didn't see one. Well, Blanding's turtles very rarely come up and introduce themselves, except for brief periods when they're out laying eggs. They're generally in the wetlands themselves. And, and he felt that he could fill in that wetlands because there were no Blanding's turtles there. And unfortunately, I didn't think that was a very good idea. Um, I'm, I'm really, um, I guess I'm somewhat shocked that somebody would try and close off wetlands and build things on top of them that have cement bases and not take care of the environment because our environment here is so important to us. And we have such special things in this county that um, it's, um, it's really hard to, to think and it doesn't seem to be part of your official plan. So I'm not sure why you'd want to okay something like this, but I guess um, maybe the economics look really good, but do you want to lose the things you're going to lose by this happening? I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, so creating a proposed development with a population the size of Wellington is not in any way compatible with the rural site that boasts wetlands, migratory bird layovers, and farmland, and should be an area that's dealt with differently. Um, and, you know, I realize it would provide a good tax base, but what do you get in return? I mean, you get a huge loss to the county and you get a loss to some very important parts of the county, which is our natural habitat and our unusual wildlife. So I'm not, I'm, everybody else has said probably somewhat the same thing and different and emphasize different things. So I won't take up more of your time, but I really hope you think carefully before you okay this development as it is. I remember meeting a gentleman up there saying there were no Blanding's turtles there because he hadn't seen one. Well, they don't introduce themselves. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. Any questions from uh, members of council for Sandra? Oh, seeing none, thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. I have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please. Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a McMahon Margotson motion that the deputation of Sandra Gorgson regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application file number OPA 2018 and Z25 18, Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinty Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. Very much. All those in favor. That carries. Thank you. So we're at 6.9 now and Elizabeth Blum. I see she's joined us. Amendment application file number OPA 2018 and Z25-18 Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinty Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. Elizabeth Shalos. Elizabeth, please turn off YouTube. Thank you. So we're at 6.9 now and Elizabeth Blum. Okay, am I there? Am I see there? she's, we can hear you, but we can also hear YouTube. So please turn off YouTube. Okay. All right, can you see, hear me now? I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. Your camera's not on. Uh, Sorry. Okay, there, great. Thank you. There you are. Okay. Um, Thank you very okay. much and uh, welcome. And a reminder, we've got 10 minutes. 
Elizabeth. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor Ferguson, councillors and staff. My name is Elizabeth Blom and I live in Ameliasburg. So I'm not in close proximity to the Quintiel trailer park, but environmental alterations have far reaching consequences. What happens in one area of the county is felt elsewhere in the county and beyond. I won't address the environmental impacts that this approval would have because there are others here who can do that better than I. What I'd like to talk about is some of the immediate negative impacts that this park will likely have on the community. A few summers back, several neighboring wells adjacent to this trailer park went dry. The loss of these wells was a direct consequence of overconsumption of water by the trailer park. It required an intervention by the province to reverse this practice. I know that the applicants would say that they have now addressed those concerns, but if this expansion is allowed to go ahead, there will be 337 new homes there. Presumably, there could be as many as four people in each household, resulting in an excess of an additional 1,300 people who will be drawing water. I live on a rural property with a well, and I know how I would feel under such circumstances. It's not just the cost of having to buy water, but the sense of insecurity that one would feel in having to live with a dry well. Water is a basic right that should be pr protected for every resident of Prince Edward County. I can only imagine how long-standing residents of the county must feel about the transformation of their community. If those of us who have arrived here from elsewhere were to think back to the things that drew us to this place, I doubt that it would be tourists and out-of-scale tourist attractions. For me and for most of us, I expect, it was the natural beauty, the wildlife, and the sense of a small rural community. That is already being lost. Many of us find it impossible to go to Picton or Wellington to buy our groceries in the summer. I have a friend who lives on the road to Sandbanks who can't get out of her driveway from May to September. Other friends are leaving because of the constant traffic jams behind their home. There are limits to how many bodies can occupy a space and I think we're running out of space. I fear that an approval for this expansion could possibly set a precedent for others to follow. The official plan is a reflection of a community's sense of self and must set strong parameters. It must also have the teeth to require developers to work within those guidelines. I don't believe we can handle much more tourism here. If developments such as this park are allowed to go ahead, we will have lost what is most important to us. And ironically, the tourists will stop coming and move on to some other unspoiled part of the province. Let us not be victims of our own success. And I want to thank you all for your consideration, your serious consideration of our concerns. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Are there any questions from members of council? Nope, seeing none. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Time is submission. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please, to receive the deputation? Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Worship uh, Maynard McNaughton. Motion that the deputation by Elizabeth Long regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file number OPA2 2018 and Z2518 Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinney Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. So we'll move on to 6.10, Don Montgomery. Your Worship, uh, we I've been communicating with Don Montgomery via email, but I he I don't know what his login name he used for Zoom, so we don't have him right now. So we're going to move on okay. to Jeremy Good. This will go to six point one one to Jeremy. Okay. And in zoning bylaw amendment applications file number OPA2 2018 and Z2518. Can you Hold turn off YouTube, please, Jeremy? I think that's it. Okay, Jeremy got the okay. Okay, if you turn on your audio, please.
There you go. Okay, let's test the audio. Hi. Yeah. I thought you had another. Uh, um... Well, we, he hasn't, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Montgomery has not shown up, so we're moving on to you. I see, okay. So right. uh, I'll remind Good you about 10 minutes. Good evening, Council. Uh, you've been convened tonight to approve the expansion of the Quinty Isle Mobile Home Park, the only commercial high density development along the entire length of the South Shore. An expansion from 600 to nearly 1,000 units, of which only 5% will accurately be described as campsites. 58 sites are set up to accommodate truly mobile trailers drawn by vehicles so that they may come and go as seasonal tourists. The rest are manufactured homes without wheels sitting on poured concrete slabs fully able to accommodate their residents year round as they already do in the existing park. Council, you're being set up. You're being set up to approve a private informal settlement almost as large as Picton on a site where there never was a town before and where there was never any plans to create one. And what a strange medieval town it will be. A walled and gated private community with one road feeding a maze of cul-de-sacs and one access point controlled by the owner. All of its residents, as is appropriate for a medieval town, are subject to the feudal terms of a land lease agreement which squarely puts control of rent and fee increases in the hands of the park owner. And all residents could be at any time summarily evicted should the owner decide to sell or convert the land which they, not the residents, own. You're being set up to overlook the vision of the official plan and the many serious concerns the neighboring Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty articulated in another letter of objection to this proposal. These were the prime considerations you cited for your unanimous decision to reject the expansion of the operations at Picton Terminal last October. As was the case for Picton Terminals, you're being advised to approve by your municipal department the so-called development services, which has provided you with a report prepared by an approvals coordinator. Is the public interest the interest that should be the principal consideration for the missile planners in Prince Edward County, County exclusively served by more and more development. Does an approvals coordinator do anything other than facilitate approvals? How is it that we find ourselves in such a similar situation as we did last October? And why do we have a report that reduces the requirement to qualify for such a major change and official plan amendment to the lowest possible level? a report that frankly distorts and suppresses evidence brought to bear on this proposal by both residents and independent experts and even experts that the municipality itself commissioned to serve the public interest. Why is the report cumulatively and brazenly biased and contrived in favor of a proponent who stands to make millions on this development? Why, as it did in recommending that the expansion of Picton ter terminals be approved, does development services assure you that they can mitigate the significant social and environmental cost of the approval with a site plan control agreement, the final negotiation of which will happen with the developer after the approval of the OPA and the zoning change, a negotiation that will take place without further public consultation or even notice, and it depends on enforcement in perpetuity. Finally, why has development services set you up to make a decision that will be the polar opposite of the Picton Terminals one? You're facing an appeal on Picton Terminals with a local planning appeal tribunal. If you approve QIC without regard for the exact same considerations that you cited to reject picked internals, you will hardly appear consistent or creditable. I'm trusting that many of the claims I make about this planning report will be roundly substantiated by others who already or will speak this evening or have written to you. I'll mention three. The report states, the existing Quinty Isle campground consists of over 600 service campsites that are accessed through an internal road network. Again, 58 of the existing 620 are set up to accommodate truly mobile trailers drawn by vehicles. The rest are developed for manufactured homes called park model trailers, many of which accommodate their residents all year. These are clearly not campsites. Even QIC on their sales page calls them cottages. The report identifies only one municipal service that would be required to accommodate the expansion of a town of something larger than Wellington, fire services. What about other emergency services? No one will require a paramedic, a doctor, a hospital bed, the police. The resort is on the South Shore, one of the wildest and most dangerous of the county shorelines. Just go to Point Peter and look at the plaques that commemorate drowning victims there. To not consider the full range of emergency services required in a municipal planning report is seriously negligent. 
Finally, I'll remind Council of my deputation in September on the threat to healthy communities posed by the practices of land lease mobile home parks. The report refers to this issue and to one of its expert resources, the Prince Edward County Affordable Housing Corporation, but it reduces it to a qualifying statement that reads, land lease communities have grown in popularity in recent years due to the dramatic increase in the purchase price of a home with land lease homes being 30 to 40% lower on average than the comparable market. The lower price of a land lease home is because the purchaser is leasing and not purchasing the land on which the home is situated. In addition, the residents of land lease communities are provided with common services and facilities. And here's what that report leaves out. However, the lack of owning property on which the residence is located ensures that the value of the home appreciates at a fraction of the real estate market. With a land lease, financial products that are available for financing of such homeownership models are more expensive than traditional mortgage financing and the homeowner has little control over the potential use of the property either in its current state or in the future. Therefore, there's considerable risk in that it can lead to a lost investment for the homeowner depending on future usage of the land on which the residence is situated. Despite making all committed mortgage payments, the homeowner at some point could be in a position of foregoing their total investment since they have no title or registered interest in the property in which their home sits. Prince Edward County's Affordable Housing Cor Corporation will not participate in the provision of land lease communities with any developments of affordable housing being considered by the corporation. But don't worry, none of those concerns apply because the report says Pebble Beach East would not be considered a mobile home park or a land lease community due to the seasonality of the operation. How seasonality cancels out unregulated hikes on land lease rates or service fees or the risk of losing your home with the discretion of the park owner is beyond my comprehension. And then there's the problem that seasonality isn't really enforceable. Here's why. Miss Valley has never enforced seasonality on the proponent's existing operation, which has resulted in the establishment of year-round residents for many years. By failing to do this, the municipality has set a precedent that will be extremely difficult to overcome should it be challenged by the residents of the new development. As mentioned before, QIC Park is a gated community with one access point that is controlled by the park owner. The expanded mobile home park would be similar to Wellington and Picton in scale, but very different in its accessibility to the public, including to enforcement officers from the municipality and relevant provincial ministries. Finally, as many municipalities, the enforcement of the PEC bylaws is complaint driven. Again, QIC is not a typical town. All its residents are subject to a land lease agreement with a park owner and as such are not free to go against their interests. There have been complaints received by Friends of South Shore from residents in QIC, but they are all very careful to remain anonymous for fear of reprisal. I hope I've given you reason and enough doubt to do as you did before so resoundingly with Picton Terminals and to deny the motion before you in favor of the expansion of Quinty's Isle Camp Park and reject, as you did before with Picton Terminals, the planning report, which is once again blatantly biased in favor of the proponent. All this is not to say that you should deny all development, far from it. There's plenty of room for it in existing zones and corridors of the official plan without the need for OPAs, and there are far better development proposals. For worse and for better, PEC has become the focus for the development of tourism and recreational um, communities in the urban communities of Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. Better because we can afford to pick and choose proposals that will not just contribute to our economy, but to the cultural, environmental, and social health of our community. For example, I understand that the developers of Fogo Island in Newfoundland are interested in the future of the county using just such an integrated approach. Finally, I sincerely believe there is a place for mobile home parks in the county to address the affordable home crisis that exists. They just need to be structured in a more secure and equitable way. There's an excellent example of a resident owned park called Kenron Estates in neighboring Belleville, which removes the exposure by exploitation by the park owner and puts the future and the value of the land firmly in the hands of the park residents. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, we'll um, see if there are any questions from members of council. Anybody? No, nope, seeing none. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please? Councillor Margotson, seconded by Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a Margotson Nyman motion that the deputation by Jeremy Guff regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications files number OPA 2 2018 and Z 2518, Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinney Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. 
Thank you, all those in favor. That carries. So we're going back to 6.10, Chad, Don Montgomery. Uh, through your worship, I'm talking to Don Montgomery right now. He's having issues logging in, so we've moved on to Jane McDonald. Okay, well, I see Jane, and, uh, Jane there. Welcome, Jane. Thank you for um, joining us this evening. Just to remind you, you've got um, we've got to plug in first. All right, thanks for thanks for joining us. Let's test the audio, please. You're on mute. Can't hear you. No. Try it. Try again. Let's hear. No, still can't hear anything. Chad, we're not doing anything on our end, huh? No, through your worship, no. Um, I, I don't know why the microphone is not coming up. Try unplugging her uh, ear earphones from the computer. It may work, the microphone. Jane, if you can hear me, try unplugging the, uh, the headset. Oh, that didn't work. Can't hear? Can you, can you hear me? I can't hear you. You want to phone in? Chad, can we set up a phone call? Yes, we can set through the, your worship. Yes, we can set up a phone call in the Zoom login information that I sent to Jane last week sometime. Um, there should be a phone number. With an access code. Okay, so we Jane, can, can you please state what your actually never mind. We'll know what your phone number is. Thank you. Okay, so we've got Don Mc, and uh, Don Montgomery's not here. Can't hear you. Uh, I'm currently speaking with Don, trying to figure out what the soup problem is. Um, hopefully, we can get some. All right, so he's he's pending. Jane's going to use the phone if we can get that set up. So we might as well move on. Chad is Nina Marie. Yeah. Can't hear you. Through, through your worship, we're letting Nina Marie in now. Okay. We'll move to her and then back it to Don Montgomery and, and then Jane by phone. So let me know when Nina Marie's in. Nina Marie is in the Zoom call. Oh, there she is. Okay. Hi, Nina Marie. Welcome. And uh, reminder, you've got 10 minutes. Hi. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And just a reminder, you've, Thank got, you so much. you've got 10 minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, we know each other, but allow me to say that my name is Nina Marie Lister. I am a Prince Edward County resident. I'm a board member of the Friends of South Shore. And in my day job, I'm also a registered professional planner and a member of the Canadian Institute of Planners. I say this because I'm bound by a professional code of conduct, which requires me legally and ethically to act always in the public interest first as it does any registered professional planner, including your own staff. We share this interest tonight. As elected councillors, you are the guardians of the public trust. And it is in this context that I am respectfully asking you, and again, with the utmost respect for this role, to act in the public interest first this evening. As a planner, I'm not opposed to development in any way. I weigh evidence. 
I weigh evidence to ensure good, sustainable and equitable plans are made fairly and projects are developed fairly in the public's interest, particularly when they ask for an official plan amendment. So I'm asking you to, to do the same tonight, to follow the evidence, make an informed decision in the public's interest. This application is asking for an official plan amendment. It is a change in the intended vision and a deviation from the direction of the democratically approved plan, both the current one and of course the new draft. So tonight I'm asking you to deny this application for the following reasons outlined very briefly and substantiated in my materials. There are four very broad reasons and you've heard a lot about many of them tonight. I'll emphasize these four. The project does not conform to the vision for Prince Edward County in your official plan. The project has not been demonstrated with any compelling evidence to be in the public's interest. The density and the scale of the development is too large for the area which is not planned for settlement. So it's clear from the research and the evidence that there will be many negative impacts on the environmental and cultural heritage which are irreversible and permanent with an OPA. These are negative effects which have been articulated by many this evening and which are also shared points of concern for our neighboring Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte stated very clearly and powerfully in their letter of March the 8th. I ask you to think about those this evening. First, this project and application contravenes the, current, the county's current and new official draft plan to protect farmland, cultural and natural heritage on the South Shore. And specifically, it contravenes the county's stated vision for the quality and the experience of the landscape and the character of the place. Rather than quoting the official plan to you, I'll remind you that the words rural properties, breathtaking vistas, tranquil and beautiful place to live and visit are all mentioned in this vision. And in this way, it will be unique for most parts of the province. This are, is our asset, that because of this combination of natural beauty, heritage and rural charm, these special attractions will be preserved, enhanced and protected over the years. This project does none of those things. There is no evidence that this OPA that you're going to vote on will quote, preserve and enhance the natural beauty, heritage and rural charm. And moreover, the experience and quality of place that is defined in the county's vision has not been referenced and certainly will not be enhanced. If anything, you've heard plenty of evidence about how the increase in human traffic and recreation and living in this area will compromise one of the most significant assets around Soup Harbor and the South Shore. The other reason that I emphasized was that this application is for a development called a camp park, but in fact is not for summer camping only. It is for a settlement, which by any other name is a town. In practical terms, the combined project will accommodate over 3,000 people. That's almost double the population of the town of Wellington, and that's conservative. At capacity, the full QIC camp park, let's remember they have a viable business already, but adding to it will rival Picton as the largest settlement in the county. According to your own traffic study peer review, which is attachment 10 in tonight's agenda, disregard the label seasonal, and the study area is no different from a residential subdivision in Prince Edward County during the summer. This is concerning because the staff planning report overlooks this crucial distinction and assumes that you council should do that as well. When normally a settlement of this size would be directed to existing serviced settlement areas. There is no such direction in the draft or current official plan and this makes for good proactive planning given the unprecedented number of development applications that are coming to Prince Edward County. Council should appreciate that the scale of development should be directed to established settlement areas. Current zoning and the one being requested here for QIC is quote unquote seasonal for a tourist commercial trailer park, but we know that QIC already operates a year round residential community. And that four season community contravenes the official plan already for permitted uses for shoreland designation. So to be clear, the municipality does not have the planning tools to either regulate or enforce seasonality. You may pass a bylaw to that effect, but QIC remains a gated community with controlled access. Even if QIC expansion remains seasonal, it sidesteps the official plan's stated commitment to roofed year round accommodation. And in this way, I emphasize that the scale and density of the development is highly problematic. And QIC avoids development charges for the infrastructure required to service it beyond the site boundary. This is a cost, ladies and gentlemen, that we will all bear. 
How is this in the public's interest? In fact, the staff planning report is silent on externalized cost of this development. There is nothing mentioned of additional infrastructure costs to service this private town, from hospitals to emergency services to road maintenance, all of which are unaccounted and yet which will inevitably become the wider community's costs to bear. When a settlement of more than 3,000 people is being contemplated, the normal course of action we use is the municipal planning process. And we do it in a coordinated and proactive way, not through ad hoc approvals that one at a time leave taxpayers and future generations on the hook for both costs and the inevitable impacts that will come. The staff report has omitted several key pieces of evidence which will help you to make an informed decision. And it's really concerning to me that PHAC, your own committee on heritage, has never been able to review this file or to provide their uh, the review of it. And that's a serious omission as well. So I'm telling you that you do not have full and complete information on which to base an informed decision this evening. Finally, uh, the QIC application for this amendment is not in the public interest because the staff planning report does not provide a substantiated rationale with evidence as to how it works for all of us. It only provides evidence about how a developer's private interest will be improved and gained. And you have to keep in mind that this application is for a change in vision and direction for all of us to our shared future. By definition, that's the official plan amendment. It's not just a request for an extension to a deck or a garage or a secondary suite. It is to rezone land that is currently rural and part of the county's legacy of a rich cultural and natural heritage, turning it into a commercial use that is private for a gated community. An OPA requires a higher bar for approval. The developer must show a benefit to the community in exchange for that rezoning. Yet this application benefits one landowner who is asking the rest of us as citizens to compromise a major landscape asset to cultural and natural heritage. Forward Holdings is a developer. They're not a farmer who severed lands for the next generation, but they purchased 558 Wellbanks Road on speculation, fully aware that the zoning was rural and did not permit this intended use. And this is their third application for an official plan amendment. It will not be the last. So in this context, council's obligation is to make good informed decisions respectfully through a fair and transparent process. It is our community future to shape, not the developer's entitled right to direct. So in sum this evening, in addition to all of the other voices you've heard tonight, which have reiterated many of these concerns, I'm asking you to act in your elected roles as guardians of the public trust, to act in our shared interest, deny this application for expansion. It doesn't conform to our vision or to the provincial policy statement in terms of natural and cultural heritage. It risks compromising a landscape of significant value for future generations, including our indigenous neighbors and partners. Council does not have consistent, unbiased, or transparent evidence before it, nor a convincing planning justification and rationale. And so this is not the basis for an informed and defensible decision. So you should deny it for the same reasons you denied the application for Picton Terminals. It's not in keeping with the vision for a special place, and the developer has not shown this. And as such, it's not in those interests. These same interests I would like to point out are those shared by and clearly expressed to you by our indigenous neighbors, the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. And so now that we have a draft plan in front of council, one that provides vision and direction for the county's future and strengthens the one we already have, now is not the time to make irreversible changes to our most special places and the landscapes that stain, sustain us and our children. Thank you for your attention, council. Thank you very much, Nina Marie. Any questions for members of council to this chair? Seeing none, thanks again, uh, Nina Marie, for your uh, time and, and your thoughts. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please, to receive the deputation? Mover and a second. <laughs> Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor Margetson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, it's McMahon Margetson motion. That the deputation by Ian Marie Lister regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications, file numbers OPA 2-2018 and Z-2518, Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinty Isle Campart Inc. be received. Thank you. All those in favor? Well, that carries. So it looks like we have Don Montgomery with us. Now, Chad, uh, we do.
For your worship, yes, Don Montgomery is joining the Zoom chat. Uh, thank you, Don. Let's test your audio, if you don't mind. You can... uh, testing, one, two, three. That's, that's just terrific. Thank you for joining us. And a reminder, you've got 10 minutes. Okay. I'm happy to see you guys because I've been uh, missing in action for an hour and a half. <laughs> I saw the first 10 minutes and that was it. So um, if I'm redundant or it's already been covered, please forgive me because I just don't know what other people have said so far. Um, uh, this morning, a fellow born and raised in the county said to me, uh, he said, uh, what the ticks and the Eiffel Tower have in common? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, they're both parasites. So uh, on that note, I'll kick off. Um, I have to, uh, not have to, I'm going to uh, walk you through a, a PowerPoint I put together for my, uh, my 10 minutes. So I am going to try that. And off we go. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Sorry about that. And uh, I should be bottom of the screen. And it says share. Yeah, that's what I want. Mm -hmm -hmm. File, here we go. Mm -hmm. Through your worship, Don, would it be okay if we ran the PowerPoint for you? That'd be fine. Absolutely. Just give us two seconds. Yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is, Chad, have you got the PowerPoint? You can run it. Uh, we're, we're opening it as we speak. Okay, so if we could, if Don, you'll have to tell uh, Chad when to flip the slides. You bet. Okay, so let's start again here. Okay, we set. Sounds good. Okay. Clock's ticking. Let it rip. We're already down two minutes. <laughs> just, just give us a second. I know. I'm just teasing. Okay. So we're just a sharing screen now. Okay. Now, can you get rid of that sidebar? Unfortunately not. I apologize. Uh, okay. Can we go to the, the beginning and the first slide? If you don't mind. Here we go. Uh, only almost had there. Yeah. Okay. Points one and two. And that's it right there. Um, bottom line, um, my two objections to this uh, application are First of all, I'd like to protect the cultural heritage of Point Peter. So I'm actually starting at the other side of Soup Harbor. And uh, secondly, and more importantly, there is no justification or need for this uh, um, amendment to be accepted or whatever. So next slide, please. Uh, can you scroll up there? Uh, yeah, beauty. Uh, Point Peter, as many people know or might not know, is just called the point. Everybody knows it is the point, and it's a place where county people go to uh, to escape, to get away from um, get away from work, get away from development, to just hang out, basically. Next slide. County people don't tend to go to the uh, Outlet Provincial Park, or I should say Sandbanks Provincial Park. They go to the point. Uh, for numerous reasons, but uh, very much so because it's undeveloped and it is in a natural state. It's rough, it's rugged, and they like it that way. Next screen, I'll show you the, uh, what I'm talking about is the view, the view from the point, as you know, when you're on the water's edge, the view is probably the most important thing. It's not what's under your butt or behind your lawn chair, it's what you're looking out at. And uh, unfortunately, um, if you look out across from the point, Peter, to the proposed, uh, trailer park extension, uh, it will double the amount of trailers that are on the shore right now, up to almost two kilometers. And that doesn't look very uh, natural, uh, quite the opposite. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm just, uh, skip right over that. Skip over the next one. So here we go. In summary, if people are looking out from the point across Sioux Harbor, what are they gonna see? Well, 
Uh, not that long ago, they would have seen an undeveloped shore. It would have been natural. Uh, as it sits right now, uh, there's a great big white slash along the horizon on the shore where Pebble Beach uh, West is. That's a mistake on my part. Um, and it's not natural. So next slide, please. Once again, you can see that the proposed area will uh, double the effective uh, development uh, along the shoreline. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the problem with agreeing to this or letting it uh, pass or passing the amendment is that it will be irreversible. It will be permanent, it will be forever. Secondly, um, the application is unnecessary because uh, it is not justified, justified if you, uh, IBE, IBI group from Kingston planning, planners were brought in by the county to be a uh, impartial, uh, out, um, impartial peer reviewer of the application and the whole process. And they say, uh, they say in their summary that a key consideration which remains is justification for the shoreland designation. Uh, the page number is wrong, by the way, there it's 199, I think it changed to, uh, sorry, yeah, 199. And secondly of all, uh, they say this is consistent with the comments previously provided to the applicant who are Quincy's Isle by Prince Edward County and or IBE staff. As far back as the original pre-consultation discussions, which is five years ago. Now, I totally understand that planning and uh, council are uh, very much overloaded with uh, development uh, applications and decisions, but just because something's been around for five years and it's been on your laps for a long time is no reason to uh, accept it. Uh, next one, please. Once again, it is our position that a key consideration which remains unfulfilled is justification of the shoreland designation proposed in the OPA. Next one. And uh, once again, the uh, justification is lacking. And once again, looking at the uh, official plan, the old official plan, uh, which they call the current one here, and the new official plan, which they call the draft, uh, neither of these uh, official plans um, justify the change. So next slide. And they say, and I quote on page 69, which is now, page 202, the applicant should provide justification for the proposed change. In other words, there has to be a need. There is no need. Uh, scroll to the next one, please. Uh, once again, now it's, it's unfortunate or possible that uh, county staff may have overlooked these comments by IBI, the peer reviewers, um, and recommended approval. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you're looking at an agenda of some 300 pages, I think is, I forget, it's just massive anyway. And so these comments may have been buried in there and easy to overlook. This whole thing reminds me a lot of the emperor's new clothes. All of a sudden for five years, we've got all this process going on and process and paperwork and paperwork and paperwork. But ultimately uh, Quinty's Isle have 800 undeveloped acres and they only need 80 to expand for their 300 and whatever it is traders. There's land there. There's absolutely no justification for us to change our official plan, um, either the old one or the new one, to accommodate their desire, their want for um, um, traders along the Super Harbor shoreline. Next slide, please. Keep going, uh, more, more, more. To the photograph, if you don't mind, please. Thank you. And you can clearly see that uh, from Point Peter, the uh, accepting or passing this amendment would be uh, catastrophic. Uh, in conclusion, I uh, think this application should not be approved for two very important reasons, to protect the cultural heritage of the point, in other words, the view, and because the application is not justified, there's no need for it. And finally, I mean, almost, uh, it's, it's sad and ironic that if this is actually passed, that the people at the trailer park will still have a beautiful view of Point Peter, but the people at Point Peter will be looking back at a shoreline that has almost two kilometers of trailers on it. And that I think is just inexcusable. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Don.
Thank she, you. Uh, we got through the technical issues. Are there any questions from members of council for Mr. Montgomery? Nope, seeing none. Thank you very much, Don. Thanks for waiting for me. Appreciate that. No worries. To have a mover and a seconder to accept the deputation, Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor uh, Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Harper, Forrester motion that the deputation by Don Montgomery regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file number OPA 2 2 2018 and Z 25 18 forward holdings Inc. and Quinney Al Camp Park Inc. be received. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? That carries. So, Chad, are we going to uh, Jane McDonald now? For your worship, yes, uh, Jane McDonald should be in the Zoom room now Jane, on the cell phone. Jane, are you with us? Jane? I think Chad might have to unmute her, Mr. Mayor. Because she's um, on a phone. Trying to. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna remove her from the waiting room and then put her back in. Yeah. Hopefully that might fix it. It did not. Try the. Is she the. Chad, do you want to instruct her to. 647 number, Chad? Yes, this is the 647 number. She's also in the waiting room as well on a computer. We're going to admit those as well. So I think. Does anyone know? I think you hit six to unmute with Zoom when you're on the phone. <clears throat> up to uh, Chad and Ann to. I. Through, through the mayor to Councillor McNaughton, I am not 100% sure if that works. Um, Me neither. Oh, well, there she is. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Now we've got feedback, Jane, it can be on one device or the other, not both. Okay. Um, you got, oh, great. You, I'm on my laptop. So, um, gosh, your phone. I'll stay on my phone. Let me bring up my computer, my uh, presentation. Wow. This is, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, we know, and we appreciate your patience. All righty. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. YouTube is off. Yep. Should be. Okay. Um, just a reminder, you've got 10 minutes. And I'll remind you at the one minute mark. Okay. So Thanks. the floor is yours. Thank you. My name's Jane McDonald. I live in Wellington. I'm here today to urge you to reject this request for an official plan amendment. This current planning department has inherited a lemon and now they've passed that mess along to you guys. And here we are tonight, this decision before you. You are being given bad advice. You should not approve this OPA. This proponent must be told no. How does this proposal serve the public interest? Planning report doesn't say. What it does provide is page after page describing all the ways in which the proposal has complied with the bureaucratic process, but the public interest the planning report is silent. Worse, this staff report contains a fatal flaw, which I'd like to walk you through. But first, let's look at the request for amendment. The subject lands are rural lands designated, so no dice for development. But the proponent wants to develop. What are they to do? Request an amendment, which brings us here tonight. This proponent wants an official plan amendment of their property from rural land to, to shoreland. What does the OP say about shoreland? 
The only designation that allows development along the shoreline is the shoreland designation. The OP intentionally limits the land that's designated shoreland. 4.12, the county's intent is to maintain large tracts of shoreline in as natural state as possible. 4.13, it's the intent of the county to protect the shoreland from development that would compromise its environmental and ecological integrity. Okay, so that's the OP giving the limited re the le reasons for limiting the shoreland designation. And what if someone wants to develop on the shoreline that isn't developed, what does the OP, that isn't designated, what's the OP say about that? It says 4.14, <coughs> designation of new lands to air to shoreland will be made once those established by this plan are largely developed. And 4.110, no further land shall be designated shoreland unless the need to do so can be detailed in appropriate studies to the satisfaction of the county. So you can do it, but you have to prove you have to prove the need to do it. So what does planning say about the need to make this amendment? It gives one sentence on page 12, and I quote: Much of the existing shoreland areas are already developed and any vacant, appropriately sized lands designated as shoreland are not in proximity to the site or suitable for the expansion of the camp park. That's the argument this planning report makes for granting this amendment. Let's follow the logic. Planning is saying that of the shorelands that are vacant and still available to be developed, none of them are big enough for the proponent and none of them is next door to the camp park. That's it. Planning is simply reiterating how the proponent's property does not conform with shoreland des designation and that there's no land right next door to them that they could develop. No sure. comment on if the proponents wish to develop his property is in the public interest or why they should be allowed to develop that property. Planning is saying Thanks. if the proponent wants to develop, they must get an amendment. I'd like to point out that must get an amendment to comply with the official plan is not the same thing as should get an amendment. In other words, planning is telling you the proponent wants an amendment, so they should get their amendment. That's like saying, Billy wants you to take the lid off the cookie jar because he can't get his hand into it. I'd also like to emphasize that this planning report has not done one bit of evaluation of the merits of this proposal, not one bit. This report, the one you are relying on to allow this amendment to our official plan is a bureaucratic roadmap. This is a planning department instructing a proponent what forms to fill out so they can get what they want. And who is asking the real question, which is why should the official plan be amended? Why should you give this proponent their amendment? Because there's no shorelands next door I mean, the proponent thinks they should get their amendment, why, but why should they? And here's where that fatal flaw I was talking about comes in. On page 12 of the January planning report, staff says, and I quote, limited access may also have been a contributing factor in the original emission of the site from shoreland designation in the 1993 official plan. That's quite a claim for planning to make about our OP that our OP is in, a, is in error. Because when I read the official plan, I read that limited access is precisely the defining criteria to withhold shoreland designation. The OP states it has intentionally limited the amount of shoreline designation exactly because and when it has limited access. So this is no mistake, no omission. This proponent's lands was designated a rural land, not because of an oversight. It was a positive decision to designate it that way, to protect shoreline from development, pursuant to the county's intention, which they make explicit elsewhere in the plan. When I first read planning's startling claim that the OP contains an omission, it sounded familiar. And that's because the same point is made in the proponent's own proposal on page 22 of their proposal, and I quote, it is unknown why this land was not originally designated shoreland, except that it is a large tract of land with limited access. This is the key point and becomes the planning report's fatal flaw. This proponent writes in their original proposal that the fact their property was not designated shoreland must have been a mistake, that the OP was an error. It was no error. The OP is protecting shoreline by limiting the number of shoreland designations. Why would a proponent speculate in their own proposal that the OP made an error? 
that because of some oversight, their property was not designated shorelands. Please think about that. The proponent is telling our planning department that our official plan is in error. Now this sure looks to me like a developer strategy, which is fair enough, I guess, coming from someone looking to make some serious cash. But you'd think our planning department might push back on this bold assertion. Here's a developer telling a planning department their plan is wrong. This is preposterous. What can we make of a proponent who purchases land right next door to a provincially significant wetland that isn't eligible for development and then asks for an OP, their second request for this property? This proponent is playing the long game. They bought this property years ago, knowing full well the OP forbid its development but time and money is on their side. They didn't need to develop the whole of Salmon Point. Economically speaking, a phased development looked sensible. And while this subject property sat undeveloped, this proponent has steadily amassed sufficient parcels on Salmon Point and developed those parcels, multiplying their holdings and building up income, plenty of it that the OP and their previous OPA already have allowed. But that's not enough. And now a few years down the road, here they come looking to file yet another request for amendment to our official plan. And why should they be able to develop this rural land? Because they want to. This is no error, this is a tactic. And what about any expectations residents might have had that this limited access, which the applicant calls the source of the error, what if that limited access is a good thing for other residents and that they can expect it to be protected by the OP exactly as the OP says it does and intends to do? And the same goes with the financial analysis of this proposal. No help from planning on that score either. Just more repeating of the proponent's own figures. So no help there in assessing the public's interest. Is this normal? You just take the proponent's word for it that they're giving the county the good deal? This is the basis of planning's recommendation and for your approval? I think this recommendation is fatally flawed and I hope you will check this for yourself. The public interest is not being represented when commercial private interests can submit proposals with preposterous claims that make it through intact after hours and hours of consultations and peer reviews. This process does not serve the public good. It is co-opted by private commercial interests facilitated by a planning department focused on administrative compliance and now about to be brought to conclusion by this council. Who is the winner in this latest episode of this zero-sum game? Clearly, it's the proponent. It is not the county citizens already inundated and exhausted by over-tourism. It's not the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty whose clear opposition to this proposal was solicited shambolically and subsequently disingenuously downplayed and is certainly not the non-human inhabitants of this county. In mm. case anyone questions, I'm almost done. In case anyone questions how dire this climate emergency really is, please do not lose sight of the fact we are meeting via Zoom on account of a global pandemic that solid silent science tells us is zoonotic in origins. Humans are pushing into all the wild spaces and the natural balance is hitting us hard on the way out. While I have low hopes you've listened to me or any other citizen who's come before you to, appro to oppose this proposal tonight and in previous council meetings, I can't live with myself if I say nothing. Say no to this OPA. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Any questions for Jane for members of council? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Jane. We'll ask for a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor McNaughton, seconded by Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, the McNaughton Prinzen motion that the deputation by Jane McDonald regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file numbers OPA. 2-2018 and Z25-18 Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinty Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. Thank you all those in favor? Thank you, that uh, carries. So we'll go to 6.14 and Ryan Knopf.
Hey, Ryan. Oh, hey there. Um, thank you for coming. Um, through, the, through your worship. I yeah. think this is Ryan Wallach, correct? Uh, it is. I, okay, I so thought we you have had another deputation. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, sorry, it's, I've got two names on two different lists. It is Ryan Wallach, so my apologies, Ryan. Oh, that's all right. Um, I probably have far less to say than your deputation, though, so. So, so Ryan was registered as a comment from the audience, so I'm going to put him back into the waiting room, and uh, or he can do it himself, and uh, we'll move on to Alan Ramsey. We don't, I don't see Ryan Noth in the waiting room. Okay, all right, so we, okay. Ryan Wallach's going to make a three minute a three minute comment. Okay, and Ryan Noth has not appeared yet, so let's go to Alan Ramsey. Yeah, that's okay. No. Welcome, Alan. Can you hear me? We're going. We're going to check the audio. We don't. I don't see Ryan Noth in the waiting room. All right. So I don't. I don't either. So let's. We're going to move on to Alan Ramsey. Three minute. Yeah, three minute Through your worship, Alan, could you mute your YouTube? Yes. Yes, I have. Thank you. All right. Thank, uh, welcome, Alan. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, remind you, you have 10 minutes and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor and members of council, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am a land use planner retained by the Friends of the South Shore, also known as FOSS. FOSS has requested that our firm provide a land use planning opinion on the appropriate, appropriateness of the proposed planning applications to allow a 337 site trail or park. Our work has been done in conjunction with the other consultants retained by FOSS and they were the cultural heritage and natural heritage uh, uh, consultants that have been referred to previously. The subject lands are, are as we've heard tonight, are adjacent to and intended to be developed in conjunction with the existing 619 site trail park uh, 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 to the west. Our firm has prepared a comprehensive planning opinion with additional comments that are contained in two pieces of correspondence. One was submitted to, to the January uh, public meeting and then a supplemental uh, piece of correspondence that was dated uh, April the 12th, 2021. I will not be going in detail in those two letters, but I will be highlighting the key findings for your consideration tonight. First, it's our opinion the proposal is incompatible with the rural character of the area, the size of the proposal in combination with the Quintial Camp Park to the west will result in a significant concentration of trail park development in the area. Combined, the existing proposed developments will result in upwards to 1,000 trailer sites and 3,000 people, which represents a significant concentration and intensity of use. Second, the proposal is intended to be operated on a seasonal basis. Our firm has considerable experience in dealing with the regulation of seasonal campgrounds. There are significant enforcement issues with the county's approach as set out in the updated zoning bylaw. And there is a risk that this facility could be operated both as, a, as permanent residency and out of season to what, what is uh, identified in the zoning bylaw. Third, we have prepared a comprehensive review of the proposal in the context of the provincial policy statement and note that there are issues with respect to several policies, particularly uh, those dealing with rural lands, cultural heritage and natural heritage and hazard lands. Next, we have provided a comprehensive review of the proposal in the context of the existing county official plan. Under the official plan, a key issue relates to how the proposal fits with the vision statement outlined in the official plan. For example, vision statement 2.1.3 indicates that Prince Edward County will be a, a tranquil and beautiful place to live and work. It will be unique from many parts of the province because of its combination of natural beauty, heritage and rural charm. These special attractions 
will have been properly preserved and enhanced over the years. It's our opinion that their proposal does not support the vision. It will contribute to the creation of a creation and enlargement of a large destination trail park with approximately a thousand sites. The scale of the development will not maintain or enhance the unique attributes of the area, including the natural beauty, heritage, and rural charm. Development of this scale and intensity should be directed to existing or new rural settlements and go through a comprehensive review rather than an ad hoc planning application process. Furthermore, the proposal does not conform with several policies of the shoreland designation, including policy 4.4.3a. This policy ex establishes criteria for commercial development. Item two of the policy addresses the suitability of the proposed density and scale in relation to the site and the surrounding land uses. The addition of 337 tourist sites on the subject lands with it will result in nearly a thousand trailer sites in the area which does not represent an appropriate density or scale. Official plan policy 4.1.7 requires uses to be designed and operated in a manner that is compatible with the surrounding land uses and the environment. There, there remain several cultural heritage and natural heritage issues that in our work has not yet been resolved. In conclusion, the proposal is not compatible with the rural character of the area. The size of the proposed development in combination with the existing Quinty Isle Camp Park will result in a significant concentration of seasonal and possibly permanent trail park development in this area. Collectively, these developments will significantly impact the, the rural character of the area, which generally consists of rural and agricultural lands, natural heritage features, and open space. And that, as has been mentioned tonight earlier on, at full capacity, this settlement will rival Picton in terms of numbers of people. The proposal is not consistent with the provincial policy statement and does not conform with the county's official plan. In our uh, respectful opinion, the, uh, the proposal uh, to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw to allow a seasonal park, seasonal trail park with 337 trail sites should be refused. Thank you very much and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Hey, thank you very much, Alan. Any questions from members of council, please? Um, seeing none, thank you very much, Alan, for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, and the seconder, please, to receive Mr. Ramsey's deputation, Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Harper Bailey motion that the deputation by Alan Ramsey regarding official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications file number OPA 2-2018 and Z25-18 Forward Holdings Inc. and Quinney Isle Camp Park Inc. be received. Thank you, all those in favor. That carries, thank you. So Chad, that uh, concludes deputations unless Ryan Noth has shown up. For your worship, we do not have Ryan Noth in the waiting room. Okay. So what I'm going to do is call a recess. So we'll uh, reconvene in uh, 8.30, 15 minutes. Good idea. 8.30 sharp.
Okay, Chad. Well, Your Worship, it's 829. Give everyone one more minute to get that. That's okay with you? Yeah. I said 830, so. Are, are we live on YouTube? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, through your worship to Councillor Hirsch, there's someone in the waiting room with your name. Is that someone you know? Hmm. That's probably Cheryl Anderson. Cheryl Anderson, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's eight thirty. Okay, so we'll um, reconvene, and we will move to item seven on the agenda, which is comments from the audience. And we have, as I mentioned off the top, we've got 14 people who are going to um, come for us. And I have the list in front of me. So um, we'll start with Nicola Chapman. <clears throat> Through your worship, uh, Nicola Chapman is not in the waiting room. The first person that we have is Victoria Taylor, and we're letting her into the meeting now. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Victoria. Get on, on mute. We've had some audio challenges, so let's just test your audio if we may. Put these on, maybe that'll help. Okay, that's that's better. <laughs> um, great, thanks for thanks for coming this evening, and you have three minutes, and I'll uh, let you know at the one minute mark. So the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for um, time to present a comment. My name is Victoria Taylor. I'm here tonight with my partner Jamie Kennedy a property owner of over two decades here in Hillier. Um, we're here tonight to ask you to reject the request for this, pro this proponent, by this proponent. We're here tonight to emphasize like others have that this is not a local issue and that's why we're here from Hillier tonight. Um, it's not a localized issue and there's nothing that we've heard or read that shows that it's in the public interest. Um, this project is not appropriate to the site, as we've heard from all the things that we've read and heard. The proponent needs to use their land in the way that it was uh, designed for in the official plan or move on. I don't see how council could support this proposal, one that would have such long lasting negative impacts to the county's cultural and ecological heritage. It just wouldn't be good leadership to support it. It would set a bad precedent as we've heard all through tonight. And it would set a precedent where the OP and zoning can change um, based on the interest of, of one business owner and one idea for a property. And it would have negative ripple effects through the whole county. Also, as we've seen and heard also that it would have global impacts as well. It just doesn't make sense that it would be in the public interest and it would be in council's decision to accept it. Um, it also doesn't uphold what you say every night in the beginning of your council meetings, the land acknowledgement that you say at the start of every meeting and that we need to continue to support this land. So if we wanna uphold the land acknowledgement and, and be true to that, 
this proposal doesn't uphold that. And then finally, um, I just wanna say that it's our duty as citizens and councils to support the stewardship of this land. And um, I wanna point out your honor that you, you sit in front of a beautiful map of the county. I think everyone can see. And if we care so much about this place and we wanna put a, a map of the county on our wall and we, we all love and wanna support and be stewards of this beautiful place, we need to start to show it and we need to make better decisions and we need to start tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. Just hang on, we'll see if there are any questions of members of council. Anybody? No. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Good you. Up. We'll receive all the uh, comments from the audience at the, uh, at the conclusion, as is normal practice. So has Nicola shown up? Through, through your worship, she has not shown up yet. Okay, so we'll go to Alan Wallace. <clears throat> Alan is connect connecting now. Okay. Oh, how do I see? This is what I was wearing. Oh, there I am. There hey, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. Uh, thank you for joining us. And you've got three minutes, Alan, as I mentioned to you earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Ferguson. And good evening. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Alan Wallace. I'm from uh, 174 Wellbanks. Road. I spoke to you on a deputation in November, and I felt ex very strongly then that this should be rejected uh, outright. When I hear all the comments tonight, I'm just blown away with the mountain of evidence that's negative, and it only reinforces my strong opinions uh, for many reasons that you've heard tonight. I won't reiterate them here, but I do have a little bit of news, and I want to just voice my um, strong opposition from, uh, from Wellbanks Road. And, you know, one of the things when I gave my deputation, one of the things I predicted, sadly, I think has come slightly true. And that when I said back in November that this, this is kind of the type of thing that will pit neighbor against neighbor. And when I heard some of the earlier deputations, you know, about traffic going onto Wellbanks instead of Salmon Point, I mean, the answer, no, the traffic should not go onto Wellbanks Road. Absolutely should not. We don't want the construction. We certainly don't want the exit vehicles but we don't want the increased traffic for our neighbors on Salmon Point. So as you've heard tonight, you know, in terms of the benefit, you know, I think we all know the numbers in terms of those that are against and those that are for. And so for that reason, I would ask you to reject it. The other thing I'd like to just point out to you tonight is just some sort of local information, if you will. Um, the other weekend I rode my bike down to the end of Wellbanks Road to the beautiful Soup Harbor. And I was, as I often do, I was mortified by what I saw. And I'd like to tell you guys about that. Um, what you're hearing tonight is some predictions about environmental damage. You're hearing about how wonderful the wetlands are and that we have to protect them for the future. The wetlands are being ruined as we speak. And what I mean by that is when I went down there, I was mortified to see someone had actually dug the rock berm down right to the ground below the water level. And there's literally a five foot wide rushing river in place. So the wetlands, the wetlands are currently draining out into Lake Ontario. I mean, mortified is, is not, is, is the right description. And I'm certainly not an environmental, you know, scientist. You've heard some from wonderful people tonight about, you know, the impact on the environment, but when you stand there, I'm actually just upset thinking about it and talking to you and conveying this to you because it's actually very upsetting to see the water rushing out of the wetlands right now as we're having this meeting. And so the damage is already happening. Um, obviously that has to be fixed, but I think it sp speaks to the larger issue here. I think somebody rightly so said, you know, the council, if they make this decision, you're gonna be policing this area, you know, not just the safety and security, but some of these environmental concerns forever. And so for, for that reason, again, just, I wanted you to hear from the local person on the street and the concerns and um, this, this environmental damage is already happening. Um, I'll just conclude by saying um, many have said, you know, to put the public interest first, I would just implore the council to do just that, put the public interest first, 
Um, we know these are tough decisions. We know there's a lot of eyes and ears on every decision you guys make. Um, I don't envy, you know, the decisions you guys are often forced to make, but I would just say, please reject this proposal. I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much, Mayor Ferguson and Council. Well, thank you, Alan. Any question for Mr. Wallace? Nope, seeing none. Thank you very much for your time. Alan. Have a good night. You too. So next we've got uh, Geraldine or Jerry Jenkinson. I know her better as Jerry. I think everybody else does too. Uh, any question for Mr. Wallace? Jerry, can you uh, can you turn off YouTube, please? Right. Yep. 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 There we are. Oh. Here I am. Okay. There okay. you are. Okay. Thank I you. I've done this as well. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that's better and, and uh, welcome and you've got three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Jerry Jenkinson and I'm a member of the PEC Field Naturalist Executive. Thank you, your worship and members of council and planning for the opportunity to present this viewpoint from Peckman of the rezoning requested by Forward Holdings. The proponents applied for the rezoning under the November 2006 official plan. We believe that OP does not support the kind of development proposed for the QIC extension. The area in question is on the shore of Lake Ontario and an ecologically important habitat that links and is vital to the ecological functioning of two provincially significant coastal wetlands, one of which is part of a provincially significant area of natural scientific interest. Mm -hmm. Section 4.1.3 of the 2006 OP states this. It is the intent of the county to protect the shoreland from development that would compromise its environmental and ecological integrity. Residential and commercial development should be sensitively designed to enhance and protect the shoreland resources and should avoid crowding of buildings, the removal of earth and vegetation, and the pollution of surface and subsurface water. The QIC extension contravenes that section. If the rezoning were granted with an average of three to four people per trailer or cottage, the Camp Park population would balloon to 3,500, larger than Wellington's and closer to that of Picton's. Infrastructure would include a large septic bed, parking pads, access roads, and more, as well described by Patricia Gale earlier, resulting in the complete destruction of valuable habitat and putting much more stress on the adjacent wetlands. Carrie Gunson, principal of EcoCare International and a professional landscape ecologist and peer reviewer, reported on the proponent's amended EIS analysis in November 2020. Ms. Gunson concludes that the mitigations proposed in the amended analysis are inadequate to protect the ecological functioning of this land. She states, wildlife diversity and habitat connectivity in the area will not only be severely negatively impacted by the development, but in some cases will be actually lost. 30 seconds, Jerry. Okay. Once an area is rezoned to allow, allow large scale developments, it's rezoned forever. And once an environmentally sensitive area is destroyed, it can never be restored to its previous state. Peckman urges you to stand firm for our natural heritage and deny this application. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jerry. Well, um, any questions from members of council? To Jerry. Nope, seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, next we have Deborah Marshall. Is Deborah in the waiting room, Chad? Yes, she's joining the meeting now.
For your worship, I apologize. He's still joining. It just seems to be taking a little longer than I expected. Is anybody else out there? Cheryl Anderson. Is she in or around? We're letting her in as we speak. Oh. Whoever's first. Oh, there's Cheryl. Now it's John. Cheryl, if you could just make sure YouTube is off. Okay, we're gonna test the audio. Can you can you say something? I just wanna make sure we can hear you. I guess you're talking to me now. I am. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. So Meyer, you've got three minutes and I'll let you know at the 30 second mark. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Anderson, and I'm here this evening representing the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. PETBO is a registered charity with the mandate to monitor, report on, and promote analysis of bird migration, and to act as official caretaker of the Prince Edward County South Shore Important Bird and Biodiversity Area, or IBA. The IBA program is an international science-based program with a specific aim, to identify, conserve, and monitor a network of sites that provide essential habitat for bird populations. Our IBA is globally significant for congregatory species and waterfowl concentrations and nationally significant for colonial waterbird seabird concentrations. In addition, 41 species at risk have been identified as migrating through, living in, or breeding in the South Shore not only birds, but amphibians, fish, plants, and reptiles as well. I'm going to share my screen. If I can. I don't have the share screen on my, let me see. Here it is. There's my screen. Uh, to show you the area covered by the IBA. As you will see, the line defining the IBA skirts the edge of Soup Harbor and touches lightly on the shore at the place where the provincially significant wetland empties into Soup Harbor. We often explain the importance of the South Shore IBA as providing a refuge for migrating birds during migration. Both in the spring and fall of the South, the South Shore is an area of rest and refueling for migrating birds. Research by Birds Canada shows that birds forage over an area of up to 30 kilometers distant from their initial touchdown point. Birds do not know about the IBA border. The shoreline of the west side of Soup Harbor is a very attractive and much visited touchdown site for migrating birds. The trailer site will be open from May to November during the spring and fall peak migration period and throughout the breeding season. A trailer site of this size could support a population of up to 1,200 people, and this population will be concentrated on the shoreline. More people mean more traffic, more disturbance, more use of pesticides, more smoke, and noise. All of these changes will have a negative impact on birds as well as other wildlife. Specifically, the increased use of watercraft will affect directly the shorebirds and waterbirds using Soup Harbor. Development of this site, as proposed, will remove precious habitat, which is, being, which is used by migrating birds both in the spring and fall, and fragment the habitat that is left. The south shore of Prince Edward County, including the shore of Soup Harbor, is the last undeveloped piece of land on the north shore of Lake Ontario. Every bit of it cries for measures to protect it. Further development will crowd out the very creatures and landscapes that support the health of the planet. I urge council to give further thought to these implications and consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. You could um, unshare your screen. Thank you, any questions for Cheryl? 
Seeing none, thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, okay, Deborah is with us now, Chad. Through your worship, yes, Deborah is here. Okay. Deborah, you're muted. And we want to test the audio. Hello. I'm coming. Oh. Just a minute. Just. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, there's another voice. Hello? Voice in the background. Thank you. Hello? <clears throat> Deborah, can you hear me? Deborah? Uh, I can't hear you. Well, I'm speaking to you, Deborah. Hello, test. Chad, I don't know what the problem is. But... Okay. Can you hear me now, Deborah? Deborah? Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? I can hear you. Well, there's a lot of noise in the background. Apologize, he's still joining it. Just... Deborah, if you have YouTube on in the background, could you turn it off? Okay. Uh... Is there anybody else out there? YouTube, Is there Deborah. Anderson? I have it off. We're letting her in as we speak. Well, somebody's got it on, and I think it's whoever's first. Did you? We're getting feedback. There, Cheryl. Sure. Okay. Dad, maybe, uh, maybe maybe Ann could have a conversation with Deborah and get that cleared up, and we'll move on. Yes, they're I emailing each other. Know. Dan's emailing Deborah as we speak, um, and we'll find out what the problem is with her. Okay, so we've got Jana Osterman as next. <laughs> They're emailing each other. Hello? Dan's emailing Deborah as we speak, um, and we'll find out what the problem is with her. Okay. Is it Yana? Jana. Jana? I want to get the pronunciation right. Uh, Yana Osterman. Okay. Yes, hello. And if you could turn off YouTube if you have it on. Please turn off YouTube. It's off. Okay, that is off. Okay. You, can hear me? you can hear me okay? I can hear you, and you've, you've got uh, three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Coleman, uh, my partner, Jan Austin, Jan Austin and myself. Uh, we live on Kelly Road, which is actually only a couple of uh, kilometers from the proposed site. We would like to take this opportunity to express our concern about the proposed development. We feel that the application for the rezoning of the shoreline property, which is currently agricultural land, <coughs> excuse me, to a high density trailer park is a totally inappropriate and is out of step with the proposed official plan and vision of the county. The pro proposal would eliminate one of the last wild and continuously farmed agricultural lands on Lake Ontario. The request for rezoning is definitely not in the public interest. There's no infrastructure for roads, adequate water, sewage and safety for residents nearby. Current roads accessing the campsite are already over capacity and cannot take a few thousand extra visitors. Last summer, has more than proven this point. We would like to urge the council to vote against the request for rezoning and support the vision of the county, which supports the agriculture, nature, and its residents. All right, that's it, short. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much for um, joining us this evening. I'll ask members of council if they have any um, any questions. Chad, I'm I'm not getting the gallery view here. Gallery, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. through your worship, if there's a view button in the top right hand, you got it? I've got it, I've got it, thanks. Any questions for members of council? Seeing none, thank you very much for your okay, time. Thank you, goodbye. So are we moving back to, to Deborah or forward to Henry Miller? Through your worship, we're moving forward to Henry Miller. Yes, through your worship, there's a view button in the top right hand. You got it? Mr. Miller, can you turn off YouTube, please? Just a minute, yeah. Glad to. Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay. YouTube okay. is off. Can you hear me? Yes, and YouTube's off. Okay. YouTube is off, sir. You've got uh, three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Your Worship and councillors for hearing me. I'm no stranger to council, having spoken many times on this particular topic. As far back as May 2018, I made a deputation to the council, uh, illustrating that the sheer size of this proposed development was scary and that council would have to be very thorough and considering it. Subsequent to that, I wrote endorsing councillor Forrester's motion, which was passed for a more robust planning process with respect to large pro projects. In September uh, 2020, I submitted detailed objections uh, to uh, the development and the rezoning. Many of those have been voiced today and I don't need to go into them in detail. And in November, I made a deputation. I was set to speak at the meeting in January and that meeting was deferred till now because we wanted to have input from the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte and the Wendat Huron Nation. It is compelling that council not approve this rezoning application. If you look at the planning department report, it is based on the false premise that let's consider this land is already shoreline and it goes into minute details about, oh, well, it seems to comply. But even the various studies are against that for purposes of wildlife pres preservation, natural heritage. So it is preposterous to then approve a change in the zoning. That change in the zoning would go against the official plan, both current and proposed provincial policy statements and simply be bad planning. It would completely wreck the nature of the county, completely wreck the nature of this rare shoreline and council cannot in good conscience approve it. It is simply too risky. And finally, the notion that, oh, somehow it was an oversight council should have in the official plan back in 1993 viewed this as shoreline is simply not true, preposterous. At that time, the Wellbanks family was farming that land, grazing cattle and fishing. So I find it very telling that as recently March 25th, again, the planning process is being improved. And in the words of Councillor Hirsch, he welcomed that improved process, described the existing process as mysterious, inconsistent, and fraught with a lot of questions. So now you're trying to get the process improved. The process has been flawed from the start with this. I do admit everybody's trying to do their best, but the more evidence that emerges is this is dangerous to approve this rezoning and I urge council not to do so. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Any questions for Mr. Miller? Well, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. And next is Ryan Wallach. Yeah, Ryan Wallach. Everybody's trying. <clears throat> Three worship Ryan's joining as we speak. Hi again, Ryan. Hey there, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I can hear you. So can the members of council. You can hear me. 
So we're good to go for three minutes. Okay. And I'll, yeah. I'll give you a heads up at 30 seconds. Great. Thank you so much, Your Worship, counselors, county staff, and fellow residents. My name is Ryan Wallach. It's good to see you again. As you may recall, I made a deputation at your meeting addressing Picton Terminal's proposal to convert his properties on Picton Bay into a container terminal and cruise ship port. I commend you for unanimously voting no on those applications. I come to you now out of concern that granting the applications under consideration tonight risks moving too far too fast in light of the concerns that have been expressed. In particular, rezoning rural property adjacent to wetlands to allow a seasonal camp park to increase its capacity from 600 trailers to over 900 trailers despite what appears to be a number of unresolved concerns, appears to set a risky precedent. A development of that size and scope for that location is certain to overwhelm the existing infrastructure. Anyone who has been to Quinney Isle during the summer or even just driven by the entrance knows that the roads, lanes, and other routes to and from the existing campground are extremely congested, allowing the camp park to expand by another 337 trailers is certain to exacerbate the situation and have a detrimental impact on the quality of life for existing owners in the camp park, as well as neighbors and visitors to the county. I'm also concerned about the proposal to address concerns by adopting a site plan control agreement that presumably would be enforced by the staff. As I mentioned in opposing the Picton Terminals applications, even were the county to hire significantly more staff and demonstrate a commitment to enforcing the zoning laws, a, con a contractual obligation like a site plan control agreement is often difficult to draft in a manner that addresses all the concerns without creating ambiguities and loopholes that inevitably lead to more disputes. Finally, although the proposed uses for the property arguably are consistent with the camp park that is adjacent to the property at issue, the property itself is not currently zoned to permit the proposed use of a seasonal trailer park. In other words, this isn't just a case about whether the county should grant a landowner the right to engage in certain new permitted uses under the current zoning. This is about whether the county should allow a landowner to change the zoning and engage in new uses on the property that are likely to negatively impact neighbors and the environment. This is just like Picton Terminals in that sense. Rezoning waterfront lands to accommodate the development of additional seasonal trailer parks sets a dangerous precedent. Waterfront wetlands are a finite resource in the county and turning them into parking lots for trailers and out of town tourists could lead to a gold rush of developers rushing to apply for similar zoning changes. The council should take seriously the precedential risks associated with granting the applications especially in the absence of sufficient safeguards addressing the impacts on these waterfront wetlands and the neighbors. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ryan. Any questions from members of council? I'm seeing none. Thanks again, Ryan. So Chad, we, um, we have Deborah ready to go. Through your worship, Deborah is being uh, allowed into the meeting right now. And she assures us that the feedback has been taken care of. Okay. Uh, wait a sec, what's going on here? Hang on, Chad, I've got technical challenges here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Deborah? Deborah, are you with us? Hello? Okay. That's, I think that's better. Deborah, can you hear me? Let's test your audio, please. Deborah? Hello, Deborah. Can you unmute yourself?
Hey, Deborah, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Okay. All right, we're going to go. There's ba a background rumble, but um, let's. I have nothing on. Okay. And let's uh, <laughs> welcome, and you've got three minutes to make your comments. Okay. My name is Deborah Marshall. I'll only offer two personal observations tonight as I've articulated objections to council over the past three years, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me. So for Prince Edward County Council to approve this application for amendment to the official plan would be akin to the Australian government handing a box of matches to a landowner living adjacent to the national forest to light a fire during a drought. The consequence would be the same destruction of wildlife habitat and natural and cultural heritage. The biggest difference would be that the natural forest could eventually rejuvenate with new growth following a wildfire. Once this land on the south shore is developed, the natural habitat and natural and cultural heritage will be gone forever. There's no going back. There is no recovering from this destruction of the land. My second point is even after three years of questions and discussions, there has been no factual statement from the municipality demonstrating how this development is in the public interest. I realize you put a lot of work into this over the past three years, but I'm asking you to please vote no to this application. Thank you and I appreciate being able to speak tonight. Thank you, Deborah. Any questions for Deborah? The point is even after three years of questions and discussions, Amy, have you guys been on? Okay. Amy, let's test your, uh, your audio, please. You're on mute. Are you done with Deborah's? Because it was still running on my YouTube. Is that okay? Uh, yes, that's much better, yes. Okay, so I would like, before I begin, I'd like to set up my share screen, if I may, please. That's fine, I'm just, I'm going to remind you, you've got three minutes and I'll, I'll uh, give you a heads up at the 30 second mark. Okay, will you please let me set up my screen first and then start my three minutes? Yep. Okay, hold on a minute, please. There was a delay on my YouTube, so I didn't think it was my turn yet. Um, okay, while you're doing that, just now I, let's, I'm ready when okay, you are. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Amy Bodman. I'm speaking on behalf of the Prince Edward County Field Naturalists. Thank you to Mayor Ferguson and Council for hearing our comment. PECFEN does not agree with the conclusion in the staff report that the environmental impact study submitted by the proponents fulfills the requirements set out in the draft official plan, nor does it fill the requirements of the provincial policy statement. Natural core areas have been designated by the province to be refuges for wildlife. Their associated protected linkages allow wildlife to move safely from one refuge to another, thereby ensuring the sustainability of the ecological functions they provide. A portion of the proposed trailer site is located in a natural core area linkage. This linkage is referenced in the staff report, but not in the developer's EIS. It is referenced in the following diagrams that were submitted recently. The location of this linkage is misrepresented in these diagrams. Here we have added yellow lines representing what we believe after much scrutiny on Google Maps to be the true boundary of the Sandbanks Natural Core area and the linkage itself. We have drawn an orange line showing what the developers would theoretically claim to be the linkage boundary. The purple line with arrows represented right here, what the proponent has actually indicated is the core linkage. It does not even come close to depicting the actual linkage drawn in Schedule B. In this diagram, they have drawn the linkage here. Looking at these diagrams, one might easily be led to believe that no part of the development will be in the linkage. In actual fact, a significant portion of the internal access roads, trailer sites, and driveways 
and a nine acre sewage disposal area are located inside the linkage and perhaps the most vulnerable part of it, very close to the shoreline. If built, they will attract hundreds, if not thousands of people to it each migrating and mating season, destroy vital coastal habitat, and with the sewage disposal area, put the linkage in danger from pollution. The provincial policy statement states, the diversity and connectivity of natural features in an area and the long-term ecological function and biodiversity of natural heritage systems should be maintained, restored, or where possible, improved, recognizing linkages between and among natural heritage features and areas, surface water features, and groundwater features. 30 seconds, Amy. We believe the EIS has not shown that this development will not have a negative impact on the ecological functioning of the linkage. Let me repeat, the EIS does not even mention the linkage. Schedule B has been on the county website since 2015. This application was started in 2018. We are concerned that consultants will take its approval as permission to ignore Schedule B and instead provide their own renditions of linkages as has been done here. In the event proponents dispute the representations of the county's natural features and areas as depicted in Schedule B, the onus is on them to work with appropriate entities to ground proof boundaries. This should be done prior to submitting an EIS. Consequently, we respectfully ask you to turn down this application. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for uh, Amy? Okay, seeing none, thank you. We need a motion to extend. We're gonna have a mover for that and a seconder. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. All those in favor? That carries, thank you. So we're on now to Jeff Rankin. Jeff. Jeff, are you uh, are you there? Chad is Mr. Rankin. I see him on the screen. So he was in, through your worship, he was in the waiting room. Um, we just let him into the meeting. Um, I don't know why he's not responding. Mr. Rankin, are you there? Okay, then let's move on to Sam Kelly. Then through your worship, the next two comments from the audience are not in the meeting room. That's Sam in the waiting room. And Irene Camp. Irene Camp is not there as well. Okay, so Sam Kelly and Irene Camp aren't there yet. Mr. Rankin, we are unsure whether he's with us or not. We are admitting uh, Sheila Kuja now. Okay. We'll see what we can do about Jeff Rankin, Sam Kelly, and Irene Camp. Okay, Sheila. Yep. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for attending this evening. And you have three minutes to make your comments. I'll let you know at 30 seconds. Can you hear me, Sheila? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? No. I, I can hear you now. You've got you've got three minutes to make. Can can I um, share screen? Um, or does Chad have have a slide that I can use? Um, I don't. See your worship, to Sheila, you can share your screen. If you hover at the bottom of the Zoom, you'll see a green icon that says Share Screen. You're going to want to click on that and then click on the icon that you would like to share. Mm -hmm. Uh, remind yeah, you have three minutes. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I'm. And I'll advise. It's too you. bad. I don't. Oh. Am I out now? Oh. oh, we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to have to forget the map. It was a great map with some um, the the wetland areas indicated, but we'll just have to um, forget that one. My name is Sheila Kuja. I'm a board member of the Prince Edward County Field Naturalist. We're concerned um, that based on a review of the project documentation, the Quinty Isle expansion project has failed to conduct due diligence with respect to the Blandings turtle, a threatened and specially protected reptile in Ontario. The peer review of the environmental impact study simply highlighted a means to sidestep the this, this study's shortcoming with respect to this species. First, we note that no targeted field studies were done for Blanding's turtles for the EIS. This is astounding when experts at two environmental review tribunals provided ample evidence that Blanding's used the interconnected wetland complexes on the county's south shore. Using only incidental observations, as Sandra Gorenson said, rather than a comprehensive study for this species is indeed a grave oversight. Our second concern is the failure to identify the interconnected wetland complexes that span this part of the South Shore, such as the two provincially significant wetlands shown on this MNRF map on either side of the proposed development, Salmon Point to the west, and Soup Harbor to the east, plus smaller wetlands near Salmon Point Road and across Wellbanks Road, and even two located within the proposed site itself. The EIS it only identifies potentially suitable blendings habitat in adjacent Soup Harbor and plays down its pr presence in the rest of the area. Such wetland complexes have been identified not just as suitable blendings habitat, but as prime habitat. If Wilbanks Road was to become a major traffic artery, this would be indeed a big problem for the turtles. Our third concern is the failure to consult with a qualified herpetologist, because each one of the 337 campsites will be built on gravel pads, and the internal network of roads will have gravel surfaces. According to experts, landings turtles prefer gravel for nesting. Why weren't the risks of mature turtles and their hatchlings from mortality due to motor vehicles, predation by pets, and wild predators addressed in the, in the EIS? In 2002, when the first zoning bylaw was approved for the Pebble Beach West campground, few were even aware of the presence of landings turtles in the county. But a lot has changed since then, and we need to adjust to new ways of thinking. Protecting species at risk, like Blanding's turtles on the county's south shore, is both appropriate and in the public interest. It's been shown to be important at ERT hearings and should also be important to the municipality. Approval for rezoning should be withheld. A comprehensive study should be undertaken to show whether Blanding's turtles will be negatively impacted by this expansion. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Sheila. Any questions for Sheila? No, seeing none, thank you very much for your time. So yeah. I, I believe I saw Jeff Rankin. Hello? Hi, Jeff, you're there? Oh, yes. Okay. I lost your audio for a minute. I, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you. Cameras, your camera's not on. Yeah. So well. thank, thank you for, um, for coming to share your comments. I'll remind you, you have three minutes and I'll let you know at the 30 second mark. Okay. I sent a letter to council uh, a couple of days ago outlining my, my objection. I don't know if anybody got it or not. So I'll just breeze through it quickly. There's uh, a little note that was added in the final site plan. I noticed that uh, the back shore at Lake Ontario access is gonna be blocked off to vehicles. There's some 10, I would estimate, uh, farmers or property owners with livestock within a couple kilometers of that back shore. And we need to access that lake. 
it's been accessed for 200, 250 years. And as far as I can tell, the county's owned it for two years and now it's going to cease to be open. So we kind of have to uh, keep that open. Okay, is that, uh, are you, are you finished? I'm finished. Oh, That's okay. our last access, last access, access to Ontario, Lake Ontario for drawing water for livestock in a, in a drought. So yeah, I don't know who closed it and why, but. Members of council, if they have any questions of Mr. Rankin, Councilor McNaughton. Hi, yes, thank you. I'm sorry, can you just uh, explain the location? I, I, I'm not quite clear the, on where. The very bottom of, the very south end of Wellbanks Road that accesses Soup Harbor. Okay, okay. Just beyond the entrance to uh, the, the emergency access to Quinney Isle, I see there's a little note that's been added to the site plan. It says it's gonna be closed to vehicular traffic. Thank you, just making sure, thanks. Okay. Very much. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, your time this evening. Thank you. So, Chad, have we got Sam Kelly or Irene Camp? Uh, through your worship, no, we do not, but we do have uh, someone in the waiting room under the name Galaxy A51. I am not sure who this individual is, um, but we're gonna admit them to the meeting right now. Okay. Are you there? Galaxy A51. I see connecting to audio, but I, I, I don't see a person. Chad, where can you get a message to this, whoever this is? Your Worship, yes, I will send them a message over Zoom. We don't have anybody else. That this is the last person, yes. Okay. Okay, let's, um, okay, Chad, I think um, I don't see any response here, so. Yeah, I sent him a message on Zoom and I haven't heard anything either. Well, there, oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, is this um, Irene? Irene, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. And okay, now I can hear you. So this is a um, thank you for coming. And a reminder, you've got three minutes to make your comments. And I'll uh, let you know at the 30 second mark. Thank you. Um, my name is Irene Camp. I represent myself. I have lived in the county my whole life. Uh, grew up at East, on East Lake Road, which is County Road 11, and now live just uh, going into Cherry Valley on County Road 10. Um, being raised in the county for uh, all my life, I have been, did I lose you? No. Are you still there? Yes, keep going. Okay. So uh, I have seen this county when it was truly a beautiful, magnificent, uh, wonderful uh, place to live. And since I was a child and I'm close to being 70, so I've been around a while, um, 
there was always tourists came to the county, always. Not like as many as they do now, but um, the provincial park came into being in 1959. I watched that happen as we lived very close. This proposal that's on the table tonight, I think would, I've listened to the whole thing tonight and I've learned a lot. And I agree with everything that everybody said. I think that this proposal would um, be a, a bad thing. I shouldn't say a bad thing, but something that the county couldn't, prop, uh, couldn't not profit us, but it, it couldn't help us in any way. Uh, we have had a lot of um, development in the county I've watched it happen. Um, and I think for most of us that live here in the county and make this county our home, we have had enough. We've had enough of the development, the effect on our environment, the effect on our roads, the effect, the effect on our grocery shopping in the summertime, those kind of things. If this development was to go through, it's just going to further impact all those things. I have serious concerns about what we've already done to our environment in the county. And I think if this proposal was to go through, it would seriously damage it even further. We need to start thinking about those things and not um, how somebody can make um, a lot of money by building on to a, bit, a campsite area that's already quite large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Any questions for Irene from the council? No, seeing none. Thank you very much, Irene, again. So Chad, You're welcome. Nicola hasn't shown up, nor Sam Kelly. Uh, no, they are not here. Okay. Then let's move on. Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the um, comments from the audience, please? Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prinzen St. Jean motion that we accept all the comments from the audience. Thank you. All those in favor? Yes, sir. That carries. So we're going to move now to uh, items for consideration, item 8.1. And we have. Um, we have representatives from the applicants. So what uh, what we will do is let's put this on the, uh, have we got the representatives in the waiting room, Chad? Yes, we had Patrick Harrington has just come in. We do not have Ruth Ferguson Althouse, but we do have Ken Ursick, Patrick Harrington, Tony Guerrero, I've got on the list here. Yeah, I do not see them in the waiting room. I will send them an email right now. Okay, so what um, what would you like to do? Put this. Oh, um, so, sorry. Uh, I just received this email from Sam Kelly. He just entered the waiting room, but we moved on from the agenda. Well, we moved on. Yeah. Okay. So we're. Uh, we're going, would you, I guess we should put the motion on the floor, Chad, and then we'll um, proceed with the speakers. Chad? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yes, we can put the motion on the floor. Okay, and then we'll um, move to speakers, okay. Could I have a mover for this? Councillor Forrester, seconded by Councillor uh, Bailey. Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Forrester Bailey motion. To the report DS 67 2021 of development services dated April 14, 2021, regarding OPA 2 2018 and Z 25 18 be received. And that report DS-04-2021 at Development Services dated January 19, 2021 regarding OPA 2-2018 and Z25-18 be received. And that the official plan amendment file number OPA 2-2018 for lands described as part one 
Plan 47R-8797, part of lots 19, 20, 21, concession to south side of East Lake Athol be approved and the zoning bylaw amendment file number Z25-18 for land is described as part one, plan 47R-8797, part of lots 19, 20, 21, concession to south side East Lake Athol be approved. Thank you. So we've got, um, we've got representatives from the applicants available now, Chad, to speak to this. For your worship, yes, we have Ruth Ferguson, Old House, and we have everyone, uh, Patrick Harrington, Kenneth Ersick, and Tony Guerrera. Okay, so Ruth, do you, do you wanna to speak to this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm going to uh, share my screen to start the presentation and um, Ken Ersick will be joining me on the presentation. At the conclusion of my presentation, Patrick Harrington is going to speak as well. And um, I understand then that we're going ahead of Matt Coffey. Okay. All right, that's fine. I'd like to start uh, just very uh, uh, quickly to go through the project chronology. Uh, this has been a project that has been uh, underway since um, our initial pre-consultation with Prince Edward County staff uh, going back to December of 2016. Uh, we uh, received an extensive uh, list of requirements for the submission um, in June of 2017 from Paul Walsh, the manager of planning. And then subsequently, we made the full su first submission on March the 28th um, of 2018, which was then deemed complete on April the 8th. Uh, there was a statutory public meeting that uh, was atten attended at Shire Hall on May 16th, 2018. And we were uh, instructed by council and planning it at the time to um, have additional consultation with the community. We held a town hall meeting in Cherry Valley that summer uh, in August. Uh, then there was a, a second submission that was filed with Prince Edward County on uh, November the 5th of 2019. And following the second submission, there was extensive peer review of all the various technical reports, um, leading to a public information meeting that was hosted by Prince Edward County planning staff at Picton Arena um, in August that year. And then subsequent to that, there was additional peer review and consultation undertaken to the end of 2020. And then also the following months of the uh, January um, meeting that did not uh, get held. There were a number of uh, technical reports that were required to be submitted to support the application. And uh, the planning justification report, which I prepared and also submitted a second uh, update to. Um, Greer Galloway Group uh, prepared uh, the uh, servicing studies uh, related to the water and the septic system, as well as the uh, stormwater management report and the traffic impact study. All of these uh, reports were peer reviewed uh, by either the county or Quinty um, Conservation and, and Prince Edward County staff. There was an environmental impact study that uh, was peer reviewed by um, the municipality's peer review consultant, uh, Mikowski Nielsen, and Ken Ersick, as I mentioned, will, is here this evening. He's a senior ecologist uh, from Beacon Environmental, and that uh, report has been through uh, a few iterations. Um, then there was also an archaeological assessment prepared to, uh, for stage one and two archaeological work on the site by Ground Truth Archaeology. And then the last three studies were requested uh, to be submitted subsequent to the complete application by Prince Edward County staff. And these were the economic impact study by the economic planning group, cultural heritage impact assessment by McNaughton, Hermson, Britton, Clarkson, and the wave uprush study by shore plan engineering. Uh, these reports have all been reviewed extensively by Prince Edward County staff and their peer review consultants and all government agencies that are responsible for those. 
And throughout the review process, there's been uh, responses provided back by the consultant team, as well as additional updates to all of the reports. And in all instances, all of the review agencies and peer review consultants have been satisfied with the technical reports in support of the applications. This uh, slide uh, shows the uh, site uh, with respect to um, the Cooney Isle Camp Park property, which is outlined in green, um, and uh, the Forward Holdings property, which is, is owned by uh, uh, the Ward family, which is sub subject to this application. The site area that's under consideration is 38.2 hectares. That's just a little bit over nine, 90 acres. It uh, consists of vacant rural land with 821 meters of frontage on Lake Ontario and 227 meters of frontage on Wellbanks Road. The wards also own other lands that are shown in the dashed line that uh, constitute um, agricultural lands to the east of Wellbanks Road, as well as um, portions of the Soup Harbor uh, provincially significant wetland. All of the surrounding lands to this uh, property are owned by Quinney's Isle Camp Park or Forward Holdings. So the combined area is 427 hectares, which is just over 1,000 acres. Access to the Quinney Isle Camp Park, uh, which is uh, um, owned adjacent to the Quinney Isle Camp Park, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, Queenie Isle Camp Park property itself it consists of 600 service trailers and transient camping sites, including the Pebble Beach West Camping Area, uh, which is now fully developed. And I was uh, the planner for Pebble Beach West and, and was uh, involved in all of the um, approvals for that, including the site plan agreement. Um, the award family would uh, develop and operate Pebble Beach East Camp Park. It's essentially an extension of Pebble Beach West and all of the services, uh, vehicular access, water supply, and recreational amenities would be shared with Quinney Isle Camp Park. However, the hydroelectric and the sewage services would be provided on the subject property. And these are some of the amenities that exist currently at the Pebble Beach West uh, portion of the site. There is a central roadway that accesses Quinney Isle Camp Park uh, and it traverses the site, the entrance at Salmon Point Road. It extends south from the existing camp park and the field, uh, which is approved for a future nine hole golf course to the Pebble Beach West Resort area. This area has 136 service seasonal park model trailer sites. And it also has a designated area for 58 service transient pull through sites. Um, this uh, area also consists of the Quinney Isle Moorings and, and Park, and that is shown in the lower left-hand side, a uh, small marina, um, as well as playground and picnic areas. There's a boardwalk, a boat launch, multi-game court, and pool and comfort station. The picture on the right shows the open waterfront corridor at the Pebble Beach West area, and it's uh, 1,300 meters long by 30 meters uh, of depth. The combined total open waterfront corridor at uh, the entire resort would be over two kilometers in length and six hectares in area. This slide shows the uh, access from Salmon Point Road to the main entrance to the Pebble Beach uh, Camp Park through Quinney Isle Camp Park. And um, the traffic impact study uh, that was prepared um, supports the entrance location uh, this report, as I mentioned, was done by the Grew Galloway Group, and it was reviewed by the County Engineer and Jewel. The existing entrance uh, on Salmon Point Road will continue to operate to acceptable levels of safety and service at full build-out. So this was based on the traffic modeling that was done by Grew Galloway. There is also shown um, on the lower uh, right-hand side of the slide the, where the gated emergency access would be installed on Wellbanks Road for the purposes of emergency vehicular access. So this would be um, uh, allow the municipal EMS vehicles to access the site uh, should it be required in the case of an emergency. This was a condition of Prince Edward County uh, through the engineering and uh, works department uh, that this be provided. Um, there was also a provision in the um, review that the applicants agreed to, to upgrade 870 meters of Wellbanks Road to municipal standards from this entrance up to Kelly Road, and that there would be additional road widening and turning circle to be provided on Wellbanks Road as part of the upgrades through the site plan agreement. 
as, as perhaps uh, acknowledged, this area was originally, Wellbanks Road south of, of this area was actually all part of this one holding. And at the outset, the uh, land uh, for the road allowance was deeded to Prince Edward County. Um, and additional um, land will be uh, deeded to Prince Edward County to widen that road allowance as part of the site plan. The site plan proposes 337 seasonal park model trailer sites with attached decks, similar to what is shown in this photo from Pebble Beach West. The density of the project was nine sites per hectare versus 30 sites per hectare, which is allowed in the official plan for trailer park development. Only 7.8% of the actual site would have coverage with buildings and decks. Almost three meters of waterfront per site would be provided um, where the official plan requires uh, 1.5 meters of waterfront per site. There would also be picnic pavilions, barbecue areas, and children's playgrounds. Each site would have on-site parking for two cars. There's landscaping that's uh, provided to each trailer site, as you can see here from the slide with the, with the trees that are planted. This is uh, Pebble Beach West and how it was landscaped. And every site backs onto an open space green area or parkette, which are linked through trails through the site. All of the existing hedgerows, wet and wooded areas would be retained on the site with an exception of a very small area of 2.6, uh, 0.26 hectares of vegetation. And this will be compensated at a three to one ratio with 0.78 hectares of new plantings. This is the site plan, oops. Sorry. This is a, a screenshot of the site plan now with, um, there's a lot more detail that's on the site plan that's been submitted to uh, Prince Edward County as part of the application, but it provides just a high level overview of the, of the uh, site plan. And I, and I should reference that it's actually been amended seven times since it was initially submitted. And um, that over 70% of the site will actually be landscaped open space. So there, there's a lot of green space I've referenced that a very small portion of the site is actually has um, the uh, trailer and deck areas uh, for the, uh, it's just a little over 7% of lot coverage. This shows the, uh, some of the setbacks that have been implemented uh, through the site plan as a result of the EIS, including this setback from Lake Ontario uh, shoreline of 30 meters. And uh, there's an additional 30 meter setback proposed along Wellbanks Road that would be landscaped. And this is to provide additional buffers um, and uh, just for, for maintenance, maintenance of rural character and aesthetic purposes. Um, all of the uh, hedgerows are shown in the darker green area. And central to the site are some uh, two small local wetlands that were init initially um, not intended to be protected because Prince, the Conservation Authority was actually proposing that there be a wetland compensation plan implemented uh, for the Sioux Harbor uh, wetland. And um, uh, through uh, further consultation with the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, it was determined that those wetlands would in fact be preserved and that the additional buffers and, and habitat would be provided adjacent to those, as well as the vegetated areas that would be retained that are shown in the, um, the uh, uh, yellowy green color. So those are some of the features of, of the uh, site plan showing some of the uh, features that are to be protected. With respect to the site servicing, there is a sewage disposal area in the northeast corner of the site and the um, permit has been issued by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks for the sewage disposal, the ECA permit. This communal system would be owned and operated by forward holdings. A condition of the ECA permit, similar to the uh, permit that's issued for Pebble Beach West, is that the services are for seasonal use only, so May to November, and that it would not serve as permanent residences. This is key because there is a requirement that a municipal responsibility would be re agreement would be required otherwise, and that's not the intention, and the uh, restriction on servicing is set out by the provincial government. The water supply has also been approved by the province. The ministry issued a permit to take water for Queenie's Isle um, for this project, and it is supplied and shared with the uh, Pebble Beach West uh, um, well system that's already in place. This water supply is treated and using a cartridge primary filtration and chlorine, chlorine secondary filtration. And Queenie's Isle owner operators uh, are licensed by the ministry for this water supply system. 
All of the sites are serviced with underground hydro, water, and wastewater, and garbage is uh, privately contracted and coordinated with Cornelius Isle. Stormwater management is uh, required uh, by Quinney Conservation Authority um, to address quality controls or level one treatment and its size to convey the applicable minor and major storm events. Um, it's designed to minimize the runoff velocity and erosion and to maintain the drainage to the wetland areas. There are five catchment areas that are proposed on site that would be conveyed to OGS or oil grit separators via sheet drainage, grass swells, and piping. These OGS units treat the stormwater runoff from the roads and driveways um, as required by Quinty Conservation. These facilities are maintained by Forward Holdings as they are at the um, uh, Pebble Beach West project and uh, QCA and the county peer reviewer have confirmed the proposed stormwater plan. Shore plan engineering was retained to provide the wave uprush study for the project. And shore plan is the uh, same coastal engineer that was, uh, was retained and, and provided the design for Pebble Beach West. And all of the findings of the wave uprush study have been incorporated onto the site plan so that all the trailers are positioned beyond the wave uprush limit from Lake Ontario and that the floor elevations of the trailer and openings would be 0.7 meters above ground level. The site plan would be subject to the QCA regulations and permit review process to address any um, potential impacts from flooding. We were required by Prince Edward County staff to undertake a cultural heritage impact assessment, and this was done by MHBC as I've referenced. Um, Mr. Dan Curry, who is a specialist in heritage planning. Um, he followed the methodology of the Ontario Heritage Toolkit and the International Council on Monuments and Sites. He determined that the lands do not meet the criteria for cultural heritage landscape outlined in the PPS or in the standards or guidelines for conservation of historic places in Canada. This, act this photo actually shows the only remaining structure on the site, an old drive shed, um, but that has actually been restored by the wards uh, for uh, the purposes of barn swallow habitat, but this was its previous condition. Um, Mr. Curry recommended uh, that although it's not deemed a significant cultural heritage landscape, that there are um, some recommendations that could be incorporated, such as retaining the existing fence lines, which uh, correspond with some of the hedgerows that are shown in the site plan, completion of the stage three archeological assessment, incorporating some of the um, historical names, Burlingham and Rankham, into the road names for, from the original farmsteads. Um, Prince Edward County staff had uh, Mr. Owen Scott from CHC uh, peer review the MHBC CHIA report and determined that it is consistent with the provincial requirements for such studies and uh, that the conclusions are valid and supportive. Turning to the archaeological assessment that was done by Ground Truth Archaeology, this was uh, carried out in 2016 and submitted to the province in 2017. In 2017, the province cleared the entire property of archaeological concerns, except for the Burlingham site, which requires a stage three assessment. So this site is shown in the uh, black outline on this uh, slide. Um, most of this, this Burlingham site is actually within either buffer areas for the uh, setback from well banks or within wave uprush and floodplain areas. Notwithstanding that, it is subject to, to be required for a stage three assessment. And it reflects a, uh, the location and a buffer area of a, of a farmstead from the mid 1800s. It's located, as you can see, very close to Lake Ontario near the end of Wellbanks Road and the site and buffer are shown here. Um, it has a special zoning that's proposed that would restrict development prior to completion of the stage three work. And uh, although there has been a consultation already with MBQ about this site and with, the arc with respect to the stage one and two, they will be further involved during the stage three archeological assessment. In the planning report, I address the uh, policies in the official plan with respect to um, land use compatibility between tourism uses and uh, other uh, residential uses, because there are some specific recommendations uh, with respect to particularly uh, trailer parks and tourist uses and residential uses. 
We have a unique situation here in that the Pebble Beach East project is essentially surrounded by land that is owned by the applicants, which forms a significant buffer uh, from any adjacent uh, residential uses. Uh, in fact, uh, they, and it will completely integrate with the existing report, uh, resort as, a, as I have outlined already. We've added the 30 meter buffer and setback along Wellbanks Road uh, as part of this to help mitigate the, um, uh, any impacts on the rural character. There are limited rural residential dwellings beyond this site, as I'm sure you're all aware, having visited the site. And that Wellbanks Road is not proposed to be used for vehicular access. This was a decision that was uh, recommended by um, Prince River County um, uh, Works and Engineering staff. Um, that it would not uh, be where the vehicular access would be, um, be main access would be provided. This slide shows that it's 190 meters from the northern limit of Pebble Beach East to the um, nearest residential zone, and it's over two kilometers distance to the closest residence on Lake Ontario. I'm going to ask now uh, if uh, Ken Ursic could join, and um, there are three or four slides now that uh, address the environmental impact study. Good evening, Your Worship, uh, members of Council, public. Uh, my name is Ken Ursick. I'm a senior ecologist with Beacon Environmental. I directed and authored the environmental impact study starting about four years ago. Um, we had consulted with Quinty Conservation in terms of the, the, the scope of the work, uh, the ecological assessments to be completed, and we also corresponded with the appropriate ministries in terms of the different methodologies to, to employ for surveys and, and so forth. Um, the, the purpose of uh, the ecological surveys that were undertaken were to basically identify uh, what are the most significant and sensitive features associated with this uh, uh, property and, and, and surrounding area. And uh, so that was uh, the, the main purpose of the assessment. Um, and it was to identify anything that was significant and sensitive that uh, would be in conflict uh, with what's being proposed. So through the EIS, we had uh, identified those features, uh, wetlands, woodlands, habitats for um, endangered threatened species. And then we directed uh, the proposal, the development away from those sensitive and significant features, um, which ultimately come in the site plan. Um, so some of the protective measures in addition to avoiding the features, not going into the wetlands, not going into uh, sensitive or significant habitats. Um, we also recommended additional protections through the application of buffers to the Sioux part of a provincially significant wetland, as, as well as buffers to the locally significant wetlands. Uh, also along the waterfront, uh, that's where we felt um, the core wildlife corridor um, um, should be established. And there's a 30 meter uh, strip that will be uh, created there. Uh, presently, the lands are farmed all the way to the waterfront. Um, and so as Ruth explained, there's gonna be a lot of uh, greening uh, trees, shrubs, naturalization plantings uh, implemented on the property where it's currently cropped. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here's a, a figure of the property. So the, the, the blue basically denotes locally significant wetlands. So those are uh, centrally located to the site. There's no water courses or drainage features associated with uh, these features or um, <clears throat> isolated surface water features. They, they also do not uh, collect a lot of water. So there's no no deep ponds or deep marsh habitats or any kind of aquatic habitat that would support fish and, and you know, turtles that would overwinter. Um, they're, they're quite shallow. They dry out very quick in the early spring and uh, they're uh, not hydrologically uh, connected to any of the provincially significant wetlands to the east and to the west. Uh, you can see in, in, the, in the purple there is the 30 meter uh, buffer that's being established to the Sioux Harbor Provincially Significant Wetland. Um, the, the limit of that wetland does not 
it, it ends at Wellbanks Road. It does not extend westward. Uh, no development is proposed in any of these wetlands. Uh, the, the green features that you see, they're, they're treed forested habitats. They're basically cedar, uh, bits of cedar bush. Uh, most of these, with the exception of uh, a small strip at the south end, uh, will be retained uh, on the site. And, uh, and then you can see from the shoreline, there will be setbacks uh, to, to respect the shoreline. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the site plan was basically built around the natural features to avoid uh, impacting them. Um, so there is no development in the wetlands. Uh, there is no uh, endangered or threatened species or habitats that are going to be permanently impacted. Uh, there are uh, endangered bats that do occur in, um, in the, the, those locally significant wetlands, they roost in the trees. Uh, we've done studies, we've confirmed their presence. We've spoken to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks who, who have jurisdiction over endangered species. And we have uh, established that planting the ratio of three to one and the buffering around those wetland features and planting them up with trees uh, will be suitable for offsetting any potential impacts. Uh, with respect to the that's the other uh, species at risk that was associated with that structure. Uh, uh, the, the, none of those nests were disturbed um, and they now have a new home. Uh, the structure was restored with the roof intact um, and the nests intact. So uh, there's now opportunities for those birds to have enhanced habitat in the future. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, our <clears throat> environmental impact study was reviewed by Quinty Conservation, um, the, the ministry, as well as Prince Edward County's own natural heritage peer reviewer. Uh, the, the natural Her heritage peer reviewer was also the individual that uh, authored the, the draft official plan and the environmental schedules. Um, and through their commenting, they, they did not take issue with the linkages uh, that are shown on the draft official plan or, or conceptual in nature. Um, and uh, we, we understand there are linkages in the landscape. We've made efforts to uh, maintain them. Can I get the next slide? I think this is a better one to, to speak to. So there is an acknowledgement that there is wildlife moving throughout the landscape, no, no doubt about that. Um, the significant uh, habitats, however, are associated with the shoreline as well as uh, the, the Soup Harbor and Salmon Point uh, provincially significant wetlands that are not being impacted by this application. We are far enough away from these features and they are being buffered and they have different habitats associated with them uh, compared to the property, which is primarily um, cropland. The, Linkages, as I mentioned, in the purple dots, um, the, the reason there's a purple arrow behind there is because that is actually the shortest distance between the two cores. Uh, at an official plan level, uh, the linkages are typically established at a conceptual level, and typically linkages are not ground truth at, at this level. Notwithstanding the peer review consultant that created the schedules for the county's official plan, also reviewed the CIS and did not find our addressing linkages or wildlife movements in, inadequate in any way. In addition to, uh, as Ruth mentioned, the, the environmental impact study as well as the site plan has gone uh, under several iterations. Um, the, the latest one was uh, in consultation with the public as well as uh, the MBQ. Uh, was a desire to see uh, a sort of dedicated wildlife corridor uh, that's maintained in the landscape. And that has now been added to the site plan. You can see that uh, to, or north of the site plan, you can see that corridor and that will be uh, designated and treated as a wildlife corridor going in the future. Um, so that's one uh, addition in response to comments and concerns. Um, 
The owners are also engaged with Nature Conservancy and other organizations to uh, look for the long-term protection of the Sioux Harbor PSW that is on their property um, and uh, efforts to steward and manage and improve it over time uh, and most importantly, protect it. And like I mentioned, uh, the shed along uh, well banks has been uh, propped up again um, and uh, it will remain barn swallow habitat for, for some time to come. I believe that's it, Ruth. Okay. I'll turn now to the um, review of the Prince Edward County official plan policies uh, with respect to the official plan amendment. And uh, there is a, a very detailed overview of, of this within the planning report that, that I prepared in support of the official plan amendment. Uh, to uh, redesignate the lands shown on this slide to shoreland and why it is appropriate. Um, it will conform to the shoreland policies. This project will conform to those policies. Trailer parks are defined as a permitted use in the shoreland designation. And um, these uh, lands would be developed for a seasonally operated trailer and recreational vehicle park. This use is also permitted in the um, recently adopted official plan. So within, within the shoreland areas, there's an acknowledgement of trailer parks as a permitted use. Uh, it, the county itself has a long history of trailer park and camping development, which may be unique to perhaps other parts of the province. But I know from working on the official plan, uh, the original official plan that is, is now been um, replaced with a new document, that camping was identified and has been identified as an important core area of Prince Edward County tourism. And Quinial Camp Park are certainly um, uh, in the business of, of providing for the trailer uh, needs of the community and, and their residents or their um, uh, clients are, are both from the local area, from Prince Edward County, from Belleville, uh, Quinney West uh, and surrounding area, as well as throughout the province and other provinces. So, so it's a very popular destination for seasonal camping. And uh, this is a use that is permitted uh, under the shoreland designation. As well, the policies of the official plan uh, related to how these trailer parks should be designed and developed have been reviewed in, in, in significant detail in the planning report and is reflected in the site plan. And uh, they have guided the uh, design of Pebble Beach East. Uh, the, um, the proposed design will exceed all the requirements that are set out in the official plan for trailer park development. And this is with respect to both parcel and site size as well as water frontage and per site as I've referenced. And for um, summary with respect to the density, uh, you can appreciate I, that it is a large project but it's also a very large land holding and uh, that uh, the density itself is one fifth of the allowable density for trailer park development in Prince Edward County's official plan. It's it just over six trailer sites per hectare. Um, the camp park it, it's itself will have uh, adequate water frontage, parkland amenities and, and uh, recreational open space to serve those uh, clients that are, that are um, spending their time at, at the camp park. And this was an important criteria when considering the justification uh, that the, um, the planning staff had asked us to review going back to their 2017 letter. As well in the planning report, I, I have uh, outlined uh, the uh, justification for the shoreland designation. And as well, this was something that um, uh, Paul Walsh had referenced in his 2017 letter that the planning justification report should demonstrate that there is a need for the additional sites and that the resort development is appropriate and, and uh, a logical uh, extension of Quinial Camp Park. Um, so this is referenced in his, in his uh, um, letter to us and, and guided us in, in preparing the justification for the shoreline OPA. And certainly throughout the county, uh, throughout the history of the official plan, there are opportunities where it is um, appropriate and can be adequately uh, developed without impacting the environment for shoreland OPAs to, to, to occur. It's acknowledged that not all lands that front on the water uh, th surrounding the county or on the inland lakes were actually designated shoreland at the outset. So there is a process that's set out in the official plan for those amendments to be brought forward. And that is what we've been doing for the, for the past four years for Quinney Isle. 
Um, we did demonstrate that there's a need for these lands for the resort operation, and we demonstrated the success and build out of the Pebble Beach West project. And this was part of the criteria that the staff had, had asked us to address. The lands itself are large enough to support the resort. They have suitable development conditions. There's a lack of constraints and it's a location that will be compatible with the surrounding uses. This slide shows the, uh, the uh, new official plan designation for the tourism corridor. Uh, obviously this site is in very close proximity to the provincial parks. It is located on a tourism corridor and the official plan uh, identifies the importance that land uses be located on the tourism corridor to support the tourism industry, including expanding the roofed accommodation sector. This is not a settlement, this is a tourist resort. Um, and uh, it does provide a significant contribution to the county's tourism economy, as well as an employment base and a revenue source. It was an economic impact uh, assessment that was done, and these are in 2018 uh, figures. Um, and uh, it showed that there would be a strong market demand for the project with an expected build out after five years. Um, the economic assessment uh, looked at both short and long term financial benefits to the county, um, including the increase in property taxes uh, to 300,000 annually, again in 2018 dollars. There is a typo in the next slide, I apologize, 860,000 in development charges and building fees. Now, when the uh, Watsons updated the uh, development charges report, they accounted for park model trailers and trailer parks as part of the development charges. And that was costed so that the impact, the financial impact to the municipality could be properly assessed as these were developed. And uh, so that that costing would go to help supporting say emergency fire, uh, emergency and fire services. The economic report uh, identified 23 new permanent jobs that would be created with construction costs of approximately $7 million over five years. And the contributions from the um, uh, Quinial um, expansion to the local economy, uh, spending on money for local goods and services estimated to be $4.5 million annually. This slide addresses the rezoning that's proposed from the RU2 and RU3 zone to the trailer park commercial 13 zone. So there are a number of provisions within the RU, um, within the trailer park commercial 13 zone, and it will also have a holding symbol. Um, this uh, zone would uh, limit the use to recreational trailer park associated with Quinney Isle. It would restrict seasonal occupancy, similar to the ECA permit from May to November. It establishes all the setbacks from the environmental features, and it sets out the conditions for the removal of the holding symbol. And finally, the 30 meter setback and landscape buffer on Wellbanks Road. There are also proposed to be the uh, rezoning from rural to EP for the two small local wetlands shown in the darker gray on the slide. These lands are currently not protected. They would be protected through this rezoning application. And I did want to stress there's no filling or, or, or changing of wetlands on this site. If anything, they are going to be protected, whereas in the past they have not been. There's a requirement for site plan approval similar to the Pebble Beach West project for Pebble Beach East uh, should it move forward. And there are conditions uh, that would be controlled through the removal of the holding symbol where that site plan agreement would be put in place. Through the site plan agreement, all the environmental impact study recommendations are implemented as well as the road widening uh, and upgrades to Wellbanks Road by the applicant. And, and with respect to the uh, question uh, of the um, closing of, of vehicular access south of the uh, emergency access to the uh, lake, this is, uh, I would say, is just an, a decision of, by Prince Edward County and, and they could make, uh, the municipality could make that decision about maintaining the access for, for farm vehicles. Um, all approvals uh, and permits must be in place by the uh, ministries and the Quinney Conservation and the Ministry of Culture as well with respect to the phase three archeological assessment. The site plan approval would also be the opportunity to implement the wildlife corridor and linkages plan that Ken referenced. And uh, this is documented in, in the sub submission we made this fall, subsequent to our meetings with MBQ in the fall, uh, where we developed this uh, plan for the uh, for the wildlife corridor and linkages to maintain these east-west landscape strips, treed shelter belts, and linear green spaces. 
and um, that uh, to have conditions with respect to any changes in this area, how it could uh, um, make sure that connectivity is always maintained and enhanced. And finally, uh, at the suggestion of MBQ staff, that there be interactive educational signboards to inform visitors about the corridor and the linkages and how to protect the features and species. Just would like to conclude uh, uh, this uh, point and then um, uh, Patrick uh, Harrington is going to be speaking briefly. Um, we have been subject uh, to a very comprehensive four year um, planning review and approval pro review process. The applicants have addressed uh, public issues and concerns. And I wanted to list some of these here for the benefit of council to see uh, some of the things that, that we've responded to over the course of that four year period. Uh, as reference, we prepared uh, additional technical reports that were requested by, um, by Prince Edward County staff. Um, my clients have agreed to the upgrades, uh, extensive upgrades to Wellbanks Road. Um, there's a well monitoring program that's been implemented, and this is not related specifically to this project, but through the pu public consultation, there were concerns expressed about the Salmon Point wells. And this uh, diversion program has taken uh, the um, water supply, moved it down to the Lake Ontario water supply well, and there's ongoing monitoring uh, about uh, the wells on Salmon Point. There are, will be preservation of those small internal wetlands and wooded areas uh, that uh, Ken has, has outlined. And the, finally, the establishment as well with that of the 68 hectare corridors for the wildlife management plan. The drive shed has been, shed has been, has been, the drive shed has been restored uh, for the barn swallow habitat. Um, and uh, there's a partnership that is uh, uh, the clients are working on with, with the Conservancy Group to um, manage the Soup Harbor provincially significant wetland that is uh, to the east of the site. And finally, there was a provision for an additional landscape buffer on Wellbanks Road. All of the peer reviews have been successfully concluded and the permits have been issued by the provincial agencies. The applicants, uh, the Ward family, they're established business owner operators with over 30 years experience in the county. Uh, I submit that the Pebble Beach Camp Park will be uh, compatible and appropriate to the site. It's a logical extension of the Quinial Camp Park. The requested approvals conform to the existing and to the new Prince Edward County official plan policies and are justified. There will be financial and economic benefits to the municipality. And finally, it's consistent with provincial policies. The official plan and rezoning represent good planning. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And you mentioned um, Patrick's going to be speaking. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, to members of council. My name is Patrick Harrington. I'm a lawyer with Airden Burles. I am counsel to the applicant on this matter. Uh, first and foremost, my client is not a developer, and this is not a proposal for a residential subdivision. My clients are Tim and Steve Ward. The Ward family has owned and operated the Quinty Isle Camp Park in this location for a number of years. They are an active and present part of the community and the successful operation and stewardship of the existing camp park is a testament to their commitment to the community and to the county's tourism sector at large. They are not absentee landlords, they're not greedy developers, and they are bu not building a new residential community on the waterfront. They are a family who has, over a long period of time, created a very family-oriented, successful recreational destination and that success has now allowed them the capacity to expand. So the question tonight before council is whether that expansion conforms with the goals and objectives of the county and constitutes good planning in the greater public interest. So for my part tonight, I'll be providing a few responses to some of the comments you would have received from some of the deputants this evening, uh, beginning with the comments from Mr. Young and to a certain extent from the field naturalists, they brought up the issue of the potential of an elimination of a linkage on the property if this uh, proposal is approved. In referencing a linkage, they're referencing the county's new official plan, which as council is aware has recently been adopted, but is not yet approved and enforced. 
And uh, those of us who practice in front of the local planning appeal tribunal are aware that when it comes to determining applications, the determining official plan is the official plan in force and effect as of the date of the original application, which in this case goes all the way back to 2018. So the new county official plan wasn't even draft approved at the time the application was applied for. Uh, and that is the, the OP that would ultimately determine this application. But even if you want to consider the implications of the new OP, in my submission, the application does conform with it. The new OP distinguishes between environmentally protected area where development is prohibited and environmentally sensitive area where development must be evaluated before it can be approved. And a linkage area falls in the latter category. The applicant has provided an environmental impact study that has looked at the area in question and confirmed that it will be no negative impacts in the functions of that area. And that EIS was peer reviewed by the same consultants that advised the municipality in coming up with the linkage designation in the draft OP in the first place. As well, the conservation authority has reviewed it and determined that there's no, not going to be a negative impact. So there's been nothing inaccurate or misleading about the EIS or any of the presentations made by my client's consultants. What has been created for purposes of the deputation was based according to the notes on a Google mapping and some of the, the uh, naturalists own assessments. And in my submission, their commentary seem to show a fundamental misunderstanding about the role the new OP plays in the evaluation of a current application. In my recommendation, you can trust the experts. You can trust the experts that have reviewed this application, that have peer reviewed, that have provided their advice and has been summarized by staff in this matter. There was also repeated reference throughout the evening to a policy 4.1.4 of the existing official plan, which indicates that you are to only consider uh, expansions that include new shorelands once the established shorelines are, shorelands are largely developed. In my submission, that actually is cherry picking a bit from the OP because it ignores the very next policy in the OP, which effectively directs council to not necessitate the undue expansion of municipal services in considering development within shoreland areas. The uh, natural conclusion of having to await the development of all the shoreline areas is that applications to expand existing tourist area developments are waiting for the extension of infrastructure to areas that have shoreline designations, but have no surrounding infrastructure. In my submission, you have to apply the OP as a whole and take into account that there are going to be areas that it would apply to have the new shoreline des shore lands designation applied, notwithstanding that other shoreland designations exist throughout the county. And the deciding factor should be whether or not you're going to necessitate the undue extension of infrastructure and whether or not the uh, granting of the new permission would be more timely and more efficient. And in my submission, the granting of this particular application is far more efficient and far more acceptable to the town that, or the county than awaiting for the future develop, unknown future de development timeline associated with some of the other shoreland designations that exist today. With respect to the issue of road safety, uh, again, the, the county has undertaken a peer review of the transportation impact study that was provided. It indicates that there are no issues with the access to the development. But the issue, main issue was whether or not there was sufficient emergency access or egress out of the development. That has been remedied through revisions to the plan to extend or expand Wellbanks Road and to provide a proper emergency exit. There was some uh, deputations in uh, harping on the fact that there was a, a recommendation for a full commercial entrance from Wellbanks. Um, well, if you look at the Jewel recommendation, in fact, what they did is attached a schematic uh, for an entrance and that schematic has designed the emergency access that my client has now developed and put onto its site plan. And ultimately it's the county's public works department that preferred that Wellbanks not be used for a full commercial entrance. And I recall that you did receive at least one supportable recommendation not to use Wellbanks in that manner. And I believe uh, Ms. Ferguson Althaus has also addressed the idea that uh, existing farm users and tractors should be able to gain access to the waterfront in the long term. That's ultimately the county's uh, call. Uh, Mr. Burt's uh, deputation looked at species of risk and conservation interest. Uh, with respect, the, the Beacon Environmental EIS has specifically looked at species at risk and made certain recommendations. And you heard a bit about the protection of barn swallow through the, uh, um, through the, the drive shed that has been rehabilitated. 
You'll also note there are certain restrictions that are imposed through the zoning bylaw that's been approved. And those restrictions all come from certain recommendations that have been made, not only by my client's consultants, but also by the consultants retained on behalf of the county that have reviewed this and provided their input. And in my submission, in granting this approval and imposing those restrictions, you will remain stewards of the county, as we heard in the earlier deputations. And my clients will continue to be the stewards of their own lands. You are not going to need to police my clients with respect to being the good stewards of their lands. You know my clients, they have a great deal of family integrity in the stewardship of their own existing lands. I can also assure you that my clients have nothing to do with whatever digging has gone on in the wetland or in the berm in the municipal right away or whatever has gone on that is now causing water to pour into Lake Ontario. Uh, I have no idea where that comment came from or why it might even be associated with my clients, but I certainly support the community's interest in getting that resolved as soon as possible, as do my clients. You heard from some of the other residents about uh, the population numbers that would be generated, including Mr. Ramsey, about the population that would be generated through this approval. However, as you also heard from Mr. Ferguson Altshaus, the density that's created is significantly lower than what the OP would contemplate for this type of area. As well, you heard some of the OP policies regarding tranquility and rural charm being cited. But again, you have to apply, according to the case law before the tribunal, the entire OP as a whole, which means in addition to considering tranquility and rural character, you must also give way to the, issue, to the county policies respecting tourism, economic activity, and the efficient optimal use of land, which is actually a provincial directive. The object in here is balance and it's balance across the county. And on this point, I think you should take close consideration of the tourism corridor policies that exist not only in your existing OP, but will remain in your draft OP. And the bar chart, the, um, the, the evidence provided by Ms. Alt Ferguson Althaus indicates that there's significant justification for the expansion of the existing tourism installation from my clients. Uh, Ms. Gale had uh, comments about the construction scheduling. Of course, that's a site plan matter and a matter that comes up at permit issuance. There was also some suggestion that there'd be impact on emergency services and hospitals in the county. Of course, those are development charge matters and DCs are going to be payable on every single one of the new lots created through this approval. So my client is making the necessary contribution to the emergency services and hospitals and other services that will need to service these lots. As well as you heard that the sewage disposal lot is only 3.7 hectares in one part of the site and has already been reviewed and approved by the, by the provincial ministry with uh, carriage of that matter. With respect to Mr. Donnelly, who's the lawyer on behalf of FOSS, he put this key question is whether the proposed trailer park is in keeping with the rural character and charm and does it promote year round tourism. As I said just a minute ago, you have to apply the entire OP. You can't cherry pick policies and make the entire question about the policies that you believe are most important to your particular client. He also to seem to take issue with the idea that there is a trailer park or a trailer park as a proposed um, complement to the existing tourism base. Well, trailer parks are found throughout the county's OP as permitted uses. And trailer parks as contemplated in this particular application is not for permanent residences. There are specific restrictions in the zoning bylaw and will be specific restrictions in the site plan. And there are specific restrictions in the servicing that ensures this is a seasonal operation. And with the seasonal operation, this type of trailer park does constitute a tourism operation. Mr. Donnelly also made reference to the issue of cultural heritage and asked you to review the McClellan uh, letter. I would also ask you to review the McClellan letter. I reviewed it and I was quite surprised at the way in which the heritage opinion was formed and presented to council. If you read that, that letter, a lot of what's in there is a recitation of official plan policies. I've worked with ERA in the past. I know that they know that in any heritage evaluation, there are a number of different federal and provincial criteria, including the Provincial Heritage Toolkit, that goes into making a heritage determination. None of that was in Mr. McClellan's letter. So I find it hard to believe that that should stand in opposition to the, uh, the uh, cultural heritage reports and peer reviews that have been provided by my client and undertaken by the county itself. 
Mr. Donnelly also concluded his submissions by saying, you're going to have to be able to look your residents in the eye and tell them what you did here tonight. And I would say, yes, it would be impossible for you to look residents in the eye and tell them that you approved something if you didn't have the mountain of evidence in support of the proposal that you have in front of you, as well as the peer reviews of each of those reports that, that approve and support those conclusions, as well as your own staff summary and support for that particular application. If you make a decision based on that mountain of evidence, you can absolutely look your residents in the eye and say that um, based on the preponderance of the materials that were brought before you and the statutory process that your community carried out over the last three years, yes, you did find approval with the applications and I believe you'll sleep just fine. With respect to Ms. Gorenson's uh, submissions, with respect to the turtles, you heard from Mr. Uh, Ursic about some of the species that were found on the site and the species that were not found on the site. Uh, turtles certainly do not introduce themselves, but professional ecologists know what to look for in terms of their habitats. The habitats for things like turtles are found along the shoreline and in the PSW, both of which are getting significant setbacks fixed in the zoning bylaw so that those areas are protected. With respect to the submissions made by Mr. Guth, it would appear that it doesn't exactly have a high opinion of the county's professional staff and its consultants. And certainly I can understand frustration at uh, staff when you get a report that doesn't go the way you think it should. I've certainly been on the wrong side of a certain level of staff reports. I just don't think it's appropriate to be challenging their integrity by asserting that their purpose is just to facilitate approvals. I believe the county staff have done their best to facilitate this process, to take in all the information from both sides and provide you with their best planning advice for you to make your own conclusions on. Um, the easiest response to Mr. Goot's submissions is this is not a mobile home park for residents. This is a seasonal resort for tourists. And as I outlined, there are multiple ways in which this approval will be regulated to ensure its seasonality. Uh, the issue with consistency with the Picton terminals, which apparently is an application that you turned down, I have zero familiarity with it, I must submit, but I do know LPAT decisions and I do know LPAT evidence and unless the people in support of the Picton terminals can demonstrate that they are in the same planning and technical rationale and are proposing an expansion to an existing tourist accommodation use, I really don't think the LPAT are going to find uh, a position in favor of one and not the other uh, to be conclusive. Uh, with respect to the submissions from Ms. Lister, um, she mentioned a change to the democratically approved official plan. Such changes are authorized by the Planning Act and an approved official plan amendment, even if it is a privately initiated amendment, is still a democratically approved amendment. It approved by the elected officials of the county. Um, she also mentioned that there's no evidence regarding conformity with the OP. Obviously, we have a disagreement on that, as I believe there's ample evidence provided by Ms. Altails Ferguson, provided by IBI Group, and provided by your own uh, staff. With respect to justification, again, you can look at the evidence that we've provided, but also uh, Mr. Montgomery seemed to fail to mention that the IBI Group peer review actually recommended approval of this uh, very proposal. Um, Ms. McDonald, you're being given bad advice, seems to be in the same camp as Mr. Guth against uh, the advice you're getting from staff. Again, I say you're free to disagree, but I would stop short of undermining people trying to do their jobs in the best way they can. But there also is a fundamental interest, uh, misunderstanding of what actually is the public interest in this matter. The public interest isn't determined in any Planning Act application by counting the number of deputations for versus the number of deputations against. The first defender of the public interest is the elected officials of a municipality and on appeal it becomes the LPAT. That's the determination in Zellers and Leamington, which is a classic case in front of the tribe. Tribunal. And whether an application is in the public interest is not defined by the deputations. It's defined by whether the, perform the proposal conforms to the PPS as well as other provincial planning policies and generally implements the goals and objectives of the official plan as approved by the county. You have the professional opinions by multiple land use planners, including your own staff and peer review that this proposal does conform. So asking for an OPA... Um, I'd just like to call a point of order. Um, if we could talk about the item under consideration and not all the deputations that were provided, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. 
Well, certainly my client has been on the line for now four and a half hours, and certainly we had quite a bit of deputation saying a lot of different things that we didn't find particularly accurate. There are a lot of knots to untie, so I'm trying to do my best to get through it quickly. But I'll finish off my submissions with a comment about the First Nations, and this will be the last section of my comments. I would like council to appreciate the difference between the constitutional requirements for formal consultation respecting First Nations or land rights or treaty rights. That is the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government and the provincial government. And that jurisdiction, that obligation to consult on Aboriginal rights and treaty rights cannot be downloaded to creatures of statutes like municipalities or deputized to applicants like myself. But there's a difference between that level of consultation and the consultations that's expected when it comes to local planning applications. And on this point, the First Nation interests do have an elevated status under the PPS and should be provided with ample opportunity to provide input. And I believe council appropriately did that when they adjourned this matter back in January so that staff could undertake that type of, uh, of consultation with the representatives, particularly of the MBQ. Although I will say on my client's part, we do have a record of having provided all of our materials to the MBQ as early as August, 2018. If Chief Miracle was not made aware of that, then that's either the fault of someone in their staff or the fault with our staff and not providing it directly to him. Um, and we do know that as indicated in the letter, there has been some confusion about which project we actually are given the number of names that have been associated with us. But the question about local consultation is whether there's been receipt and consideration of the First Nation concerns. And I believe that has occurred here. In particular, the zoning bylaw now has a hold on it to ensure that there is a stage three archeological assessment. And as part of that process, I believe the First Nations will be invited to witness any of the excavations that occur on the site and would have input to anything that was found. And otherwise, the March 8th letter expresses a general concern with respect to the environmental integrity and especially of the PSW. And we say that concern has been fully addressed by the EIS and the restrictions imposed through the zoning bylaw amendment will ensure the appropriate setbacks to the wetlands and the provincial wetlands. So in the end, local consultations with First Nations is not intended to be a yes or no uh, veto on the part of the First Nations. It's an opportunity for dialogue, to hear a different set of experiences and the different perspectives on the type of application that's brought forward. And we believe the safeguards that are needed to address the First Nation the concerns that have been expressed to the letters that have been filed have now been factored into the zoning bylaw that is now before you. And we do truly believe that you are now lawfully able to proceed with the decision on this matter this evening. And those would be my comments. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, and Ruth, I, I presume you, you have concluded. So I think um, at this point, I'll ask if there are any comments from our planning staff before we go to um, matters for uh, any comments and then We'll have questions from, from staff or from council at least, sorry. But. Thank you, Mayor Ferguson. Um, it's been a long night. I did have a presentation, which I think I'll, I'll share a little bit uh, of that with you. There's been a lot of information um, shared tonight, so I don't want to repeat um, anything that's been said so far, but um, oh, I'll there. go through, sorry, go ahead. Any questions that will Anyway, go ahead. I will share my screen and, and just go through this as uh, quickly as possible. Okay, so the purpose of my discussion is to um, summarize the planning application process that we've seen to date and to provide a summary of uh, the application review that's been conducted by staff and by our peer review consultants. So the applications, as we know, are to amend the official plan and um, in the zoning bylaw for the site known as 558 Wellbanks Road. And the application for the official plan amendment is to redesignate the site from the current rural designation to the shoreland designation. 
and to amend the zoning bylaw from the RU2 zone to the special trailer park commercial zone. Um, just want to note that um, in addition to these applications, a site plan control application will be required um, in the future, but th that application is not before us. So when we're talking about the, the site plans, at this point, they're really just, it's a, it's a concept and it's not part of a formal site plan application. So that, that would come at a later date. Um, so the next slide I have up is, is the key match on the location of the property, um, an aerial showing the sand point uh, to the west of the site, Point Peter to the southeast, and of course the site being um, uh, located at the end of Wellbanks Road. Um, I did take some photos uh, during a number of site visits. This one is from Google, uh, showing Wellbanks to the south and um, Wellbanks Road going north. Um, this is facing east across the subject land, which of course is currently vacant and would be the site of the future uh, camp park. And these are lands to the west. Uh, these lands are also owned by the applicant and um, they are currently farmed up into a boundary, um, which is in close proximity to the British Pacific and wetland, which is approximately where my cursor is pointing right now. Um, the existing entrance to Quinty Isle is on Sand Point Road, uh, which would remain the main entrance for, for the camp park in addition to the expansion. Um, some photos of the existing Pebble Beach West. So ex examples of what Pebble Beach East will, will ultimately look like. Um, so the effect of the official plan amendment would, would be essentially to permit the expansion of the Quinney Elk Camp Park onto the subject property. The zone that the applicant is seeking is the uh, special trailer park commercial dash 13 zone. It's a special uh, trailer park commercial zone that would establish a maximum of 337 seasonal camp park, park model trailers, uh, as well as accessory uses. Um, not sure if we've seen Schedule E of the official plan uh, so far tonight. The subject property is currently designated shoreland. Sorry, the existing camp park is designated shoreland. The subject property is just to the east of that in this area here. And of course, we have the two wetlands further to the east and then on the western boundary of the property. Um, Currently the property is designated rural and I just wanted to point out that the rural designation itself does allow for um, a certain level of commercial uses al al already. Um, it does allow for commercial uses related to the rural economy, tourism, uh, antique shops, farm related um, commercial uses, also some industrial uses which serve the rural economy. So it's not uncommon to find commercial and industrial uses in rural areas. The trigger for the OPA official plan amendment in this case is the fact that it is a trailer park expansion and the shoreland designation itself um, contains policies which, which deal with how uh, camp parks are designed. The expansion of shoreland designations are permitted in the uh, official plan uh, when they are justified. and um, satisfactory that it kicked to the county and, and we've heard lots of debate about um, the justification for the, uh, the redesignation, but it is permitted. Um, the existing zoning, again, similar to the official plan, the, the current or the existing camp park is presently zoned in a special trailer park commercial dust 12 zone. And so the expansion, which is just to the east of that, containing the RU, RU2 zone and a small section of uh, lands just to the west of this property line would be rezoned to the trailer park commercial dash 13 zone. And so currently the RU2 zone obviously is very limited in what they are permitted to do, residential uses, non-farm residential uses that, which are limited to agricultural farming, etc. Um, 
new uses that are being uh, proposed include the trailer park expansion, related accessory uses. And just wanted to make a note that, um, that a definition of seasonal is included in the zoning bylaw and um, defines the occupancy of park model trailers to be between May and November only. So in addition to that, there are holding provisions attached to the zoning bylaw. There are setback provisions attached to the zoning bylaw. And um, most recently, the applicants have agreed to extend a 30 meter setback from, from Wellbanks Road. So that has been incorporated into the zoning bylaw, which is in front of us this evening. And um, that, that's a slight change from what had been in front of us back in January. Um, the proposed concept plan, which, which Ruth went through in fairly detail. Um, wanted to touch on the Indigenous consultation that we undertook. So staff had engaged with the uh, Mohawks of the Bay of Pony as early as January uh, 2020. And um, we held a number of discussions through the first half of 2020. And unfortunately, we were not able to connect formally until uh, it was approximately October of 2020 and uh, resulted in a meeting that the applicants uh, and myself attended on October 29th. In addition to MBQ, uh, the applications and the information was also circulated to um, the Hiawatha First Nation and the Aldersville First Nation. The Those two in particular First Nation communities are within relative close proximity to, to Prince Edward County. And um, we felt that they, they may have an interest in the site. So that's why they were circulated. And, and that was around the end of October as, as well as our meeting with MBQ. At the time, we weren't aware that Huron Wendat had an interest in the site. And, um, and so when we received the, the letter from them in January, um, they became part of the consultation, which we then undertook uh, really since January until until now. Um, of course, in addition to here on Window, we also received a letter on January 19th from MBQ indicating that further further consultation was required. Um, regarding MBQ, following the January 19th meeting, um, we had additional discussions with MBQ staff, uh, we engaged in a site visit, which took place on February 10th. Um, MBQ staff, as well as myself, uh, walked the site with the landowner. And um, some of the results from that uh, site visit were included in the letter that was received uh, from MBQ on May the 8th, or sorry, March the 8th. Regarding Huron Windet, uh, staff had discussions with a uh, representative from here on Windat, I, I believe it was it was in January or shortly after the May or the January 19th meeting. And um, here on Windat have since indicated that they have no further co comments on the application. We provided um, all the background information, all the technical information. And uh, I presume that they reviewed it in detail and, and got back to us um, and indicated that there was no further consultation that was required. Um, the letter from MBQ has been summarized in, in our staff report, and, um, and so they've been, it, it's been included in, in our analysis and, and, and it's part of our recommendation. Um, Ruth touched on the history of public consultation, and in our opinion, the level of public participation has been, has been adequate, um, and so we, we are confident that um, you know, even though we, we've heard a lot of negativity towards towards the project, we're we're pretty confident that um, we've engaged in public consultation uh, to to the fullest extent possible. Um, we have we've categorized as as best as we can all, all the comments that we've received. Um, currently. We have 148 written comments from from members of the public, and um, and so we've organized them a little bit into into categories. And so, as we can see, traffic 
and road access is, is a fairly substantial concern, uh, natural heritage and, and the environment, cultural heritage, servicing and infrastructure, size and density. These are areas where we wanted to focus a little bit on because that's where the bulk of the concerns were. So I can go into those in a little bit of detail. Um, starting with the planning review, in addition to our staff review, which, which began, as my understanding is as early as 20, 2016, um, with, with our previous manager, Paul Walsh. And um, it was also reviewed by a, a, um, our, our planning consultant, IBI Group. And we received a, a memo from them on April 30th, 2020. IBI reviewed all the technical documents, uh, provided comments on the parkland dedication, um, reviewed the concept and the configuration, rec made recommendations on the zoning bylaw, they concluded that the justification for the OPA appears to be reasonable and that the development would conform to the shoreland designation. Um, the traffic study was peer reviewed by Jewel Engineering. They did conclude that the level of safety along Sandpoint Road and at the intersection would not be impacted by the development. They did recommend upgrades to Wellbanks Road, which has been agreed to by the applicant and um, the applicant has agreed to provide a secondary access for emergency vehicles, uh, which is a recommendation of Joe Engineering. Um, the Beacon report, we heard from Ken Ersick earlier. His work was reviewed by Mikelski Nielsen and Associates. We had received uh, some comments from uh, Gordon Nielsen, uh, who, who, we, who we had the county had retained to, to review the documents. And, um, he provided a series of recommendations in April, which, which Beacon then responded to, and um, a follow-up letter from Mikowski Nielsen indicated that all the concerns that they had had been addressed, and um, any further recommendations would be addressed through a site plan agreement. Some of these recommendations included additional buffers to Lake Ontario, buffers to Sioux Harbor, wetland, uh, 50 meter buffer to to the wetlands which are on the subject property, uh, landscape tree planting. Um, we did hear a comment about uh, construction. This particular uh, recommendation regarding vegetation removal during the construction season, which will be defined in the site plan bylaw or the site plan control agreement. Um, the applicants have implemented barn swallow nesting structure in the existing uh, barn, which they have renovated and the measures for the protection of bats uh, will be included in the site plan agreement. So in addition to, to those recommendations, the applicants have agreed to incorporate the wildlife corridor. We've heard quite a bit of discussion about the linkages between the two wetlands and the importance for wildlife to uh, move throughout the area. And the wildlife corridor is an, is an attempt to establish um, you know, 100 meter area where no development will take place and, and uh, the movement of, of, of wildlife will go unobstructed. Um, cultural heritage is, is an item that we've heard quite a bit of this evening. Just wanted to point out that the, this, this project was first discussed at PHAC, the Prince Edward Heritage Advisory Committee in September, 2018. And at that time, there was a recommendation put forward that a GA be prepared, a cultural heritage impact system be prepared by the applicant. It wasn't in, going back to the pre-consultation, it wasn't a study that was identified by staff early on because the provincial requirements didn't trigger it. However, it was requested, and so the applicants had retained uh, MHBC to prepare cultural heritage impact assessment, which was submitted with their applicants resubmission in um, November of 2019. October 2020, uh, it was discussed again at, at PHAC, and there was a recommendation put forward that the GIV be peer reviewed. And so the county retained um, CHC Limited to provide a, a review, not only of the applicant's 
Chia, but also the reports conducted by Bray and ERA. And the result of that peer review was a conclusion that the MHVC Chia completed by the applicant's consultant is consistent with the provincial requirements for such studies and concludes that it, that it is valid and, and supports the material presented. Concerns regarding infrastructure and servicing, and Ruth touched on this with the MOE and the environmental uh, compliance order. Um, additional measures can be included into the site plan control agreement that that's, that speak to some of the MOE requirements to to make sure that they get they are followed. Um, stormwater management was peer reviewed by Jewel Engineering and. One recommendation for a maintenance plan for the oil and grip separators that are proposed. Again, that it's an item that can be included at the site plan control stage, um, as well as a lot grading and drainage plan, which which would be completed at that time as well. Um, we've heard concerns about site density, and and again, Ruth touched on this. the The shoreland policy does provide some guidance on what an appropriate density level is for, for this type of development. Um, the applicants are proposing a density which is far less than what is currently permitted in the policy. Uh, the total combined density for Pointy L would be 6.4 sites per hectare where a maximum of 30, 30 sites is permitted as per this policy. Um, the smallest site is 280 square meters where the minimum is 200. And there's plenty of shoreline available. Um, for, for each site. So there, there's lots of amenity um, for the folks who are staying at this camp park to, to enjoy the waterfront. Um, the permanent use versus seasonal use. Again, it this is not a settlement area that's being proposed. This is this is a this is a tourist commercial development. And um, the MOE has approved an ECA which is limited to from May to November. Um, it's it's enshrined now in the zoning bylaw. Um, the draft zoning bylaw and the site plan control agreement will then contain further provisions that define the seasonality of this operation. So the proposal is, is most certainly a, a, a tourist commercial development, which is seasonal. Um, some of the other concerns, the noise pollution can be addressed through the noise bylaw, light pollution. We can work through this through site plan. There's no street lights proposed. Um, there's different lighting fixtures that we can recommend downward facing um, light structures um, to to try to mitigate any light pollution that may be emitted from the site. And again, public engagement. We've heard a lot about public engagement, and um, we we went through on an earlier slide kind of the levels of of public engagement that we've that we've undertaken and we're we're fairly confident that um that the level of, of public engagement is appropriate. So in, in conclusion, um the application in our opinion is consistent with the provincial policy statement and um it's consistent with the official plan and, and that's why we've we've recommended that both the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment be approved. That's it. Thank you very much, Matt, for that. If you could unshare your screen. Uh, we are at 11 o'clock. Okay. All right. I think um, so. We've heard from staff, we've heard from uh, Ruth. Uh, I must say, I can't recall another application that has gone through as much scrutiny over the course of its gestation as this has. Um, scrutiny by the public, certainly scrutiny by staff, scrutiny by council, um, who have engaged in considerable discourse and consideration of emails and other messages and asked thoughtful and considerate questions of staff to um, you know, lead us to uh, hopefully a decision tonight. So um, I'll open the floor to questions of staff. I see all the uh, hands going up and we'll go with, I've got a list 
formulated anyway. Councillor Hirsch followed by Councillor McNaughton, Nyman and Bailey. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, uh, we finally get to, uh, to discuss this wealth of material. Um, I'm only going to make one statement this evening and, and, uh, and this is it, it's kind of been formulated. This application has put me in a, an exceedingly difficult position, I find. On the one hand, we have an applicant who seeks to expand an already existing operation and who has over the last four years been willing to modify their proposal to deal with the objections raised. On the other hand, there are environmental and other concerns which have been brought forward by several parties, many of which have been satisfactorily addressed by the applicant, but some of which cannot be remedied by the very nature of the fact that the proposed development is near an important provincially significant wetland, and because part of the expansion will reach into a natural core linkage area as prescribed in our new official plan, which council approved in February. The number of reports and studies and peer reviews and reviews of peer reviews and revised plans has reached unprecedented proportions, including a remarkably thorough staff report. And I have read and studied every single one. I've participated in all but one of the public and semi-public meetings going back to 2018. I have heard all the many deputations and comments made publicly at Committee of the Whole, Council and various committee meetings. The amount of public interest has been remarkable. There has been a well-funded campaign against the project as well. However, at the end of the day, we have to make a decision, I believe, based not on opinion, not on emotion or exaggeration or nimbyism, but on the evidence, on the facts, and on our existing official plan. I would remind council, and nobody has mentioned this so far this evening, which I find a bit remarkable, uh, around council and the public that in 2012, council faced the same issue, the official plan amendment, which allowed the creation of the existing bottom part of the camp park was approved by council, OPA 58. So in some respects, the horse is already out of the barn. And the concept that these lands retain their rural character is somewhat mute in my view. The Quinty's Isle operations for, form part of the tourism corridor that the county has consciously created. I believe the extensive back and forth over environmental issues has resulted in acceptable setbacks from key features, protection of groundwater with installation of new lake-based water systems, protection of the barn swallows by maintaining and in fact improving their current home, uh, not to mention dedication uh, by the proponent of their portion of the provincially significant wetland on the adjoining property, uh, putting that into conservation. As little evidence of the presence of, the presence of species requiring the use of uh, natural core linkage up to sandbanks has been presented, I can't give that issue too much weight. Public pedestrian access to the Sioux Harbor uh, provincially significant wetland is achieved and undesirable vehicle access prevented at the bottom of Wellbanks Road. As to the suggestion that the property is part of the quote, last undeveloped stretch of shoreline on Lake Ontario, I find that the Salmon Point Peninsula is already highly developed for residential, agricultural and tourism uses, and not at all like the rest of the Athol and South Marysburg South Shore. The new official plan delineation of natural core areas would seem to concur as Salmon Point is not a natural core area, albeit some of it serves as linkage between core areas. So even though from a purely environmental standpoint, there is no such thing as good development. In this case, I feel that we must as a council, follow the analysis of all the evidence, absorb the work of the professionals, including our planning department, and conclude that this project satisfies the requisite planning principles and approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. In fact, Councillor McNaughton, I've added Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to start out um, by uh, thanking the citizens who came to speak and 
to thank our clerk for calling a point of order just a few short minutes before. I'm not accustomed to hearing sort of a courtroom style procedure at our council meetings. And uh, I just wanted to say that even if we do disagree with deputations when they're offered, um, especially if they're offered well and in good faith, uh, that we should be grateful to receive them and grateful to hear them. And pardon me, I've got a busy body of a cat. Um, he's very interested in planning. Uh, and it's not necessarily customary to um, offer rebuttals directly to the witnesses, shall we say. And I really want to thank all the citizens who came out and presented, regardless of whether I agree with um, what you've said or not, I respect that you've taken the time and made the effort to, um, to present your thoughts. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I do have a question moving on. I've got a question for staff. Uh, is there a way that we can uh, assure the local farmers um, that the access for the end of well banks, what I understood from the site plan, the proposed site plan is that uh, it would remain as is. It would not be closed to ve vehicular traffic. It just would not be developed further. And Kim, and I believe, um, Ruth mentioned that as an option. And I just wanted to confirm, is there a way that we can assure um, Jeff Rinkin and other farmers in the area that that is the case? Not too long. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair to Councilor McNaughton. Um, through the site plan application, um, staff will have an opportunity to, to make further recommendations on on how Wellbanks Road is managed. And, and if it is, in fact, council's wishes to to make sure that that access at the south end is accessible um, for farmers to continue to access that that um, that access point to Lake Ontario, we will certainly make sure that 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 remains the case. Follow up. Yep. Go ahead. As we don't, as as site plans don't uh, return to us at this time. Uh, would right now be the time for us to um, assure you that that would be uh, that that would be our our preference. It certainly would be mine. I'm just speaking for myself, but I believe this is the only opportunity we'll have to do that. And I, if um, if C there's a way for seek guidance from the CAO as to how the process might unfold. Through the, um, your worship to Council McNaughton, I would just uh, remind Council that uh, by bylaw, you delegated to the planners the authority to, to me and the uh, planning, um, the director of development services, uh, delegated authority over a number of planning decisions, in, including site plan, but you always have the authority to request that it not. Uh, be delegated. And in fact, most of the complex, well, all of the complex site plans we've had since that delegation bylaw was passed, uh, we have um, volunteered to bring it back to council. So I would expect, given the wide community interest in this, that we don't need to be told to bring it back to council. And that would be our recommendation is to make this a council decision on the site plan. Thank you. Councilor Nyman. Sorry, hit the wrong button. My question's been asked, and as long as we get the opportunity to ensure that uh, road stays open, um, and it sounds like Madam CAO said it was coming back to us and we'd have that opportunity, I'm okay with it. It's gotta be a guarantee that it's coming back. <laughs> Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, like Councillor Hirsch, I've got something that I need to read so that I get it correct. Um, I found my notes from the January 19th meeting and in those I had a number of concerns. Um, for the most part, the staff report has addressed these. One of these was the density and I noted that the proposed total density is 6.4 units per hectare while the official plan uh, allows 30. My concern about archeology span and consultation with the MBQ was now looked after 
on page three of the staff report, where it notes that um, in Safe Street Archaeological Assessment and consultation with the MBQ and other nations, that will take place. So I had to worry about that. That's now looked after there. Similarly, um, on Matt's report, the 30 meter setback on the new site plan looks after one of my larger environmental concerns. My issue with this becoming a community of full-time four season residences has been addressed many times. I sincerely hope that it stays true. Um, I'm not sure how we guarantee that. I still have concerns about the likely increase in traffic, just as I believe it was Mr. McLean suggested. Uh, I hope that the impact of this is analyzed further as soon as possible. The peer review, uh, I believe Matt noted, was in 2018. And I know that over the past couple of years, we've had that much more traffic going on. Many of the deputants have brought up this and a number of good points. I sincerely hope that the Beacon EIS just presented has helped to look after their environmental concerns as it has looked after many of mine. At the same time, I note that the proponent has worked with our staff and shown a willingness to change. What I'm getting from staff and all that I've read is that they have been able to work within the guidelines. Noting this, and with my previous concerns mostly looked after, um, along with all of the good points that uh, Councillor Hirsch made, I find that I will be able to support this going forward. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts and Councillor Harper. Sorry, Mayor, having trouble unmuting myself. Um, I have a bunch of notes here. I'll try and go through them very quickly. Um, the first point I'd like to make is I, I, I take offense as a counselor that um, the, an inference would be made that our staff are trying to fool us or that they've been co-opted or that they're blatantly biased. That is just not my experience of many years on council. Uh, we have professional staff, they give us their best advice um, and, uh, and they're excellent and I have a lot of respect for them. I do remark though that someone made a deputation this evening as a registered professional planner and did not, to the best of my audibility, did not declare a conflict of interest. I will remark though, that uh, the expertise and talent of our staff has been reflected in a serial manner every time we take one of our, uh, we, do, we don't take staff recommendations and we end up at the OMB or LPAT. I think it's clear to any documentarian or anyone that wants to look into it that the L, that LPAT or the OMB tends to side with our staff reports and our staff recommendations regardless of council decisions. And I think we've seen that at the end of last year on Loyalist Parkway at Remax issue. We saw it just last month with regard to uh, Barker Street. The third thing is that who is going to use Quinty Isle, the Quinty Isle expansion? Well, it's the folks that use it now. They're mostly middle income families. Uh, they can't afford you know, to buy properties here, uh, like many of us can, and are lucky to, and we're, I'm, I'm grateful for being able to do that. But there are middle income families, maybe even lower middle income families. And I've always had a, a worry that we would lean into being some kind of exclusive Muskoka East for those that can afford it, or a Niagara on the Lake East. And um, it's, that's not something I'm going to, uh, uh, support, um, and I'll continue to be vocal about that. So it's wonderful. I mean, I can afford, many of us can afford seven figure family homes on the bay and a couple of acres, but I am in no way inclined to exclude others of less means from being able to enjoy a bit of this paradise as well. Um, the public interest has been raised. Well, I, I, the public interest Everybody's trying to define the public interest, but what it is not 
It is not a head count. The public interest isn't a head count. It's not the aggregation of the public's interests, plural. Uh, but it's also, fair point, it's also not just about complying with legislation, laws, provincial policy statements. And in the political realm, and I'm, I'm open to improvements on this, but the public interest, I think, is it, you know, it's about acting fairly and reasonably with a duty of care and using our best judgment and balancing very compassionate and competing interests, such as growth, such as the environment, but also being aware, because we're obliged to be aware as councillors and staff at Shire Hall of our limitations and restrictions in coming to the conclusions. So after five years of scrutiny, nine or 10 technical reports, seven site plan amendments, undertakings for things like stage three uh, archeological study as required by the Mohawks, the Bay of Quinty, I fully support the Development Services staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I too wanted to say thanks to all the presenters. It um, uh, was, uh, was quite a night. Um, lots of persuasive uh, arguments and, and points were made and, and uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, but I think ultimately for me, the, um, the staff report and, and the technical review uh, very much uh, lend support to, uh, uh, to carrying through with this. Um, and uh, I put a lot of weight on what our staff have to say and certainly the uh, choices they make in terms of professionals that they deal with. So I feel that technically um, that we uh, we're obligated with this. I think the question that was Bill's just raised and, and a few others have, have raised is what is the what is the public interest here? And uh, I think that sort of falls into, you know, needs and wants. And on the needs side, I certainly understand many local people in the area want the status quo. Um, I certainly understand where they're coming from, but I think it's in the public's interest to consider the needs that we have as a county in totality. And I think that's the job as the council here is to think what is the greater good in all of this that we need to think about. And I think, we, I think we'd all agree that um, uh, we're somewhat in no man's land. We have, uh, you know, the county is an expensive municipality to run. And, you know, we need more revenue. We need more tax dollars. We need more economic activity. We need more jobs. And I think something like this development, whilst it may not be for all of us to live there ourselves, I think it's an important part um, of, of our history, uh, as been said. And I think it's also a question of fairness. I think that we have to recognize that, uh, as Bill also was talking about, you know, what is affordable to, uh, to a working class uh, household. And I, I think that this is, and, you know, as, as one of the uh, deputants mentioned, which I don't agree with, this, it's not about all about high end tourism. That is not the vision that we're striving for here. We're striving to be reasonable and fair to as many people as we possibly can. So, for all those reasons, I'll be supporting this. Uh, uh, this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Maynard, then Councillor Forster. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so mine's uh, somewhat prepared as well. Um, on a personal note, uh, 40 years ago or more, I regularly camped on the shoreline uh, in the area of this property. It was unrestricted, unregulated, loud, and often rowdy camping. Um, in my opinion, this area has long since been in its natural, pristine, and tranquil state. Uh, in contrast, the proposal in front of us contemplates a well-managed, regulated, monitored camp park. And uh, adding on to what some of the others have said, for many of us in this region, who could never own waterfront property or have easy access to it, trailer camping offers an affordable opportunity to enjoy nature, the waterfront, and to share the beauty of this area. In my view, meaningful access to natural and waterfront areas is in the public interest. All people, regardless of where we live, leave our footprint on the natural environment. With good planning, proper controls and oversight, I believe that we can mitigate 
to some extent, the damage that our collective footprints leave. I support this application and the staff recommendation as presented. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'd just like to start out and thank all the residents of Athol, Prince Edward County, for coming forth and doing their deputations. Uh, this has been a very difficult application for the residents around Salmon Point, Well Banks Road. It's been difficult, difficult for the applicant. They've had to go through a lot. It's been very difficult for our planning staff. They've been called names. They've been told they don't know what they're doing. Some of the emails that we've had from are getting certain residents to the counselors. Again, very difficult application. One of the difficult, most difficult ones I've ever had to deal with in my 10 years on council. Throughout the night, I started writing down stuff and I have about four pages here of questions. Um, I think almost everything has been answered. Uh, I've been involved with this almost right from the start talking to residents, being on top of this, talking to the wards, talking to planning staff, talking to the mayor. I think we have a pretty good application here. You know, I, I heard tonight about cultural heritage and what it is in the county. And I look back, you know, one of the main things is agriculture. It has always been here. But right after that, camping and cottaging, right back to the early 1900s has always been a huge part a huge, huge part of Prince Edward County. It's changed over the years from your little tiny cottages on the lakes to campgrounds, but it is a recreation that we have in our backyard that people from all over Ontario and the States enjoy and truly love to come here. Managing it, as we found out with COVID has been very difficult, but we can only get better in that. But we should be happy that people want to come to our backyard and play and enjoy life. So I guess my only question is here, and this will be for planning staff. It's that Matt, again, you and your team have taken a lot of tough questions and and, and uh, hard comments against you, but are you confident moving forward that you have a good application and a dependable application? Because I, I think you've done an amazing job. I just want to hear you say that. To the Chair to Council Forrester, we are 100% confident that this application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the official plan, and represents good planning. Okay, I'd just like to say thank you for the hard work you put into this, and you will have my support tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Margotson. Very brief. I didn't prepare anything like everyone else, but I, I did, I have been to the site and I studied and read all the documents and I, I came to the meeting prepared to, to support it. I recognize and appreciate all the comments from people regarding the potential uh, negative aspects of this, but when I balance it and based on my professional experience and being in development and working for a municipality and working for a conservation authority and my own personal experiences in life. I think this is, this development is something I can support. I think an expansion of the existing site, we know the people that are running it. I, I believe the, the natural, you know, partnering with the Nature Conservancy of Canada was a, an important thing for me in terms of uh, recognizing the wetland that they do own, no development on the east side of Wellbanks Road, all these things together, plus uh, providing a place for people to enjoy Lake Ontario. Um, all of it is, is the reason that I'm supporting it. So that, that's what I wanted to say tonight. So Thank you. Anybody else? Any other hands? Okay, before we vote, just let me um, wait. And as I, as I said off the top, I, I really can't recall an application that has gone through the scrutiny that it has gone through over the course of 
these many years. This originally um, came up in, in 2016. So we are, you know, we're now five years, five years into it. And as I said, it, it has had unbelievable scrutiny and comment from, from the public. Um, members of the public, it, the, all the folks that spoke here today are only a small portion of the um, number of other, other members of the public who have communicated to us by email or telephone or whatever other measure. Um, and they uh, it, ultimately, their, you know, I think their comments um, and uh, their concern ultimately led to additional measures uh, being considered by our planning staff and the proponents. And the proponents have, have um, from what I have seen over the years, willingly and generously made amendments and adjustments to the application to make it better. I, I think Councillor Hurst and his comments about uh, natural habitat um, were, were um, spot on, so I'm not going to go into those. But one of the points that did come up, has come up by members of council uh, this evening, is the, uh, is the fact that, you know, we've, we've got an obligation to make, to allow Prince Edward County to be enjoyed by, by others. We have an extremely robust, if I can use that word, short-term accommodation sector um, that is effectively unaffordable to many people or unavailable to people that live here. And I, I think it's important that we afford where possible and make decisions on the, the basis of helping people who may reside here uh, of lesser means and Councillor Roberts articulated this very well. And that needs to be part of the decision making. But I want to commend staff because uh, the, the planning staff have had, um, have had to deal firsthand with this. And they have done so willingly. They've done so diligently, professionally. And we have a in front of us, I think, a very good sound report um, with all the bases covered in terms of um, the scrutiny and peer reviews and reports and everything else that support approval of this. So I am in favor of moving this, uh, this forward this evening. And I want to, I do want to um, certainly thank and commend the public for their engagement in this. Because ultimately, I think they made it better. But uh, staff have done an outstanding job, and I want to want to thank the planning staff, um, and 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 um, Matt, and Michael for doing a great job and providing the responses uh, that we we needed this evening. So thank you all very much. So I'm going to I'm prepared now to call the vote. On this, we've got the mover, we've got the seconder. So I will call for a show of hands of all those in favor, please. And that carries. All right. So we will move on to. Item 9.1, could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Harper. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a Bailey Harper motion that the following bylaws be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. 9.1.1, a bylaw to adopt an amendment to the official plan forward OPA 2018. 9.1.2, a bylaw to amend County Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw Number 1816-2006 as amended, as amended 
forward Z25-18. Thank you. All those in favor? I'll vote, thank you. And uh, 10.1, confirmatory bylaw. Mover, seconder. Councillor Margitson, seconded by Councillor Nyman. This is Margitson Nyman motion that the following bylaw be read at first, second, and third time and finally passed. A bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward at the special meeting held on April 14th, 2021. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. And lastly, a motion to adjourn at 11.23 p.m. Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Maynard McNaughton motion that this meeting now adjourn at 11.23 p.m. All those in favor? <laughs> no. Thank you, we're adjourned.